Our panel of break fix petrol heads are back for another rousing what should I buy debate. Using unique shopping criteria, they are challenged to find our first time collector the best vehicle that will make their friends go, where do you get that? Or what the hell is wrong with you? At the next Cars and Coffee. We get ideas and suggestions for show topics all the time. And recently someone asked us to revisit the idea of purchasing your first classic car. Never looking to turn down an opportunity for a hearty debate, we said challenge accepted. And you know what that means, listeners. It's time for another fan favorite, What Should I Buy episode. That's right, Brad. And as our listeners know, all What Should I Buys have shopping criteria. But in this case, it unravels very quickly when you take into consideration all the different genres and eras of collector cars. Are we talking pre-war, post-war, muscle car, the malaise era? or something more modern. So this begs the question, what exactly is a collector car? And with the help of our esteemed panel of guests tonight, we think we can solve this puzzle and come up with some great suggestions for the first time collector car buyer. All of our guests tonight have been on the show before and have experience in the classic car, prospecting and investor car markets. So please join me in welcoming back to Break Fix our panel of petrol head juggernauts, Mark Shank from the 90s What Should I Buy episode, Don Weberg from Garage Style Magazine, Rob Parr from Collector Car Guide, and Chris Bright from Collector Part Exchange. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, thanks. Uh, We're honored that you all even want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as everybody knows, the What Should I Buys are a fan favorite. They're a little bit more of a happy hour style, a little bit more casual. So tonight's big debate is the first time classic car buyer. So who wants to take a stab at defining what a classic car is? Now, in the intro, we said classic car and collector car. Are we using these terms interchangeably? Because they're different. Are they? If you read Jalopnik, they come out with articles all the time. These are the next future collector's cars. Or just because it's a classic car doesn't make it a collector car. And just because it's a collector car doesn't make it a classic. My business is named Collector Part Exchange. We didn't name it Classic Part Exchange because we wanted to keep the door open for modern classics. People like are talking about modern Ferraris or whatever. You know, we wanted to have that be open to them. But I think... Technically, classic car is 1989 and before is what I, I believe it's typically. The it sounds like is. a middle-aged man definition. Exactly. I would, I would with I, this. I'm mansplaining right now. Would you please <laughs> shut up, Mark? Do, do classic cars go along the way of classic rock? Like if we listen to a classic rock station now, we hear Nirvana. Does that mean anything from the 90s is considered a classic? Hell yeah. I mean, in Maryland, it's uh, 20 years and you get a you can get a classic car tag. Yeah, is right. that the standard across yeah. the across I mean, the US? So, so Brad, actually, let me flip this around on you and say, I'll give you the exception for the future classic near term. What's a car that's 20 years or older that's a collector car that isn't a classic? Is a All gremlin? Right. Silence, is a I will. Is, 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 is a gremlin a classic? <laughs> it's right yeah, up there it with is. the HHR and the PT Cruiser. But let's let Don weigh in. Yeah, I, I, I'm listening to all of you, and and I all of you are hugely well qualified. And you know, I'm just an old fart who has an idea here. You know, one thing that has always upset me when you look at magazines, you look at podcasts, you look at television shows, and all of a sudden. Let's talk about, oh, my God, the instant collector, the Aston Martin something. Oh, my God, the instant collector, the Ferrari something or other. Well, what year is that Ferrari something or other? Oh, it's a 2022, but it's an instant collector. Wait a minute. What? You know, it's like saying the Viper. I remember reading about that years ago, the Viper. Oh, this is an instant collector's item. Well, yeah, it's going to be limited production. It's going to be high performance. It's going to be very expensive. Nobody's going to be able to have this car. But what makes a five liter GT a collector car? Oh, nothing. Nothing. That's not a collector car. Until today, you ask anybody, hey, I I got a 93 GT, triple black, chrome ponies, five speed in the garage, 25,000 miles. Oh, my God, I got to have that car. Well, wait, wait, wait. You were the same guy that when the car was new and I bought it, you said this would not be a collector car. You know, Eric, you and I talked last time about DeLorean pretty extensively. And I think I told you I've got a stack of magazines, each one with articles from the day with DeLorean in it, one of my favorite stories is in one of them, a young writer talks about what a piece of garbage the DeLorean is, that it'll never be worth anything. It's going to fall apart before it's worth anything, blah, 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 blah. Fast forward 30 years, I have another magazine 
where the writers gushing over DeLorean and how different they were and stainless steel and gull wing doors and the plastic underbelly and all this other wonderful stuff. And it's such a great car. It's an absolute collector car. You should buy it now while they're priced right. That was written by the same guy. <laughs> 30 years apart. Oh, yeah. Wow. Don't you think there's this like cars are new and then they go into the valley of death? Even yes. if we look back, there's even lots of Porsche 911s, like when they weren't that valuable, and then all of a sudden they became like $250,000 cars. Now they've come back down to earth, but it's like something goes away and then it starts becoming like Ferrari Testarossas, like five years ago, you could get one for $40,000. They were not expensive cars. Now they're expensive to own, but now they're back up over in 120, 140 range. And well, look at your Countach's. Those cars right. have gone completely nuts. The right. $800,000, it'll be a couple of years, there'll be a million dollar car. Right. The residual but, value of the cocaine you'll find in a test for Rosa or Kudentosh <laughs> is worth more than 40 grand. That's true. And they were all brought to you by DeLorean, the dealer of the year for 1982. You know, Mark, I had a little bit of time to actually think about your question. I had to do some mental math because you said 20 years older. That's 2002. How about the Ford Tempo, the Ford Escort, the Ford Taurus? Are those classics? Oh, God, no. The Chevy uh, Impala? The Taurus SHO, Yes. The tempo, so so okay so it's got no. so, so it's got uh, the escort if you model. actually got the like the good one you, you're talking about a particular model the Ford Probe I'm, I'm, I'm ragging on Ford a lot here because it's just popped into my head Ford Probe but is just great the Volkswagen okay, Passat nice. is not a classic it's I'm sorry the 2001 Volkswagen Passat is not yeah a of course it's a good okay car. but it's, it's a, a collector car so wait the 2001 no, it's not a collector car either you but that wasn't well, that your was my your question, question was anything a 20 car years that's 20 years old that no you said classic, classic. It, give me a car that's not a classic right. that is 20 years Eric, old you didn't tell me these I guys were married should, and it's very undefined but anything that's desirable is the collector car i mean if you want to if exactly. you want a Ford probe gt or something v6 to the whoever wants the car that's a collector car Right. I mean, right. that same guy has life. six of them because, you know, he needs the parts. <laughs> like the guy on this panel that I'm not going to name who has about 200 Mark IVs in parts. <laughs> it's going to be a collector car one of these days. That's all I know. <laughs> yeah, because you're It'll be the at one least five them. collector cars. <laughs> now, wait, wait, Mark IV. Volkswagen. Are we talking the German Mark IV or from Dearborn? Volkswagen. No, not your Lincoln. Volkswagen. We're talking about Volkswagen. Oh. Yeah. Forget yeah. Not the Toyota Mark IV either. <laughs> So let me yeah, do yeah, yeah, the Toyota, good, very good. Building on what you were saying about the tempo and the probe, et cetera. I have a 79 Chevy Caprice. I inherited it back in 2002. Nobody gave a crap. I was the only one who cared about that car. It was mint condition, 40,000 miles, two-tone brown. My wife hates it. She still hates it to this day. But here we are now, 2022, and I got to tell you, that car gets attention just as easily as the DeLorean, as the Mustang, as any of the others. It really commands a lot of attention and a lot of respect, even though, again, years ago, nobody gave that car. Any, it, it was like driving Rodney Dangerfield around. It was horrible. You look like a man that would have that car on 22 inch rims. Am I right? <laughs> no, God, no, 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 no. Wow. I think that was like the biggest burn I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me, let me do this. Let, let's wrap up this thought. I think it's very challenging to define what a classic or a collector car is. However, there is one staple guideline that we can fall back to, which is the official list of approved full classics from the Classic Car Club of America, which I happen to work with over the last couple of years. And I'll read it to you so we can separate a couple of hairs here. The Classic Car Club of America defines a full classic as a fine or distinctive automobile, American or foreign built, produced between the years 1915 and 1948. Many factors come into play, but a classic was a high price top end vehicle when new and was built in limited quantities. That is their definition of a classic, which now we can say is distinctly different than something that would be a collector vehicle. I call bullshit on that. That's just. <laughs> yeah. Who the hell is a member of the Classic Club of America? <laughs> Gunther's not on here, is he? <laughs> no, and he was supposed to be. But, you know, again, Eric, going off to your definition, when you think about what you just read, 
oh, the Testarossa, instant collector item. Oh, the Viper, instant collector item. Oh, the Porsche, blah, 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 instant collector item. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because nobody can afford them. They're limited production. It's exactly what they were talking about. I like those types of cars that are, like I own an Alfa Romeo Giulia Super. So it's a boxy four-door sedan, but it's really cool. That Mm -hmm. car gets so much attention, but it was a mass market car. It was well-designed. It had a race pedigree. But there were tens of thousands of them made, but most of them were left to rot. So then they became rare again. It's like Fiat 500s. They're really cute. They're cool, but they were a mass market car. A lot of them rotted on the vine, and now they're pretty extraordinary and rare, even though they weren't really valuable to begin with. I mean, not that I'm trying to insult you or anything, but your Alpha and my Caprice, they've got a lot in common. They really do. They're little boxy cars. At least pair up your Fiat 124 with this Alpha. I mean, come on. No, 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 no. We're talking about boxy sedans. Oh, okay. (laughs) Not Mignetti Morelli sponsored vehicles. Yeah, I got you. It's all good. No, no, no. AC Delco, baby. AC Delco. (laughs) Especially with the LSS. Especially if it's an Impala SS. Oh, those are the best, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Oh, the 90s <laughs> ones, yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, my neighbor has one. I salivate every time I see that thing. The LT1 so, engine. Mm-hmm. So for our first time collector car buyer, let's call them that, or classic car buyer, I think we need to now split this into different genres, which is why we actually have all of you on this show, because you represent the different genres that these cars can be dissected into. Unfortunately, Gunther couldn't make it. He was on an earlier episode of Break Fix in season one, where he came on and talked about Packards and actual classics from the classic car of America. So we call those pre-war classics. Some of those are post-war up to 1948, just after the Second World War. Then you have the post-war cars, much like what Chris has with that Alfa Romeo being in the 50s and early 60s, right? That heyday, the Dolce Vita times. Then you've got these pre-gas crisis, the muscle cars. This is where Rob and Don come into play. And then you've also got the Malaise era, which Don is very familiar with. It's one of his favorites. Then there's Mark coming at this from the last 20 years and older in the 90s with those are those collector cars now. So Now let's kind of go around the horn a little bit here and talk about maybe some suggestions for the first time collector buyer for a car that's, let's say, in today's market with adjusted for inflation, $50,000 or less. So who wants to take on the challenge of a suggestion for our first time car buyer? Square body Chevrolet. (laughs) (laughs) Square body Silverado. But I will say from Gunther's episode, one thing he did recommend, a lot of people like to go out and buy the rarest car they can find. It's like, oh, it's an instant classic. Gunther's philosophy was exactly the opposite of that, especially with the cars that he was dealing with. You want something that was more mass produced, something that a lot of people have, because then it's a lot cheaper and a lot easier to get replacement parts. And when you're dealing with cars from pre-1948 or whatever he said, you know, the they're all were, rare at that point. That yeah. is extremely important to be able able to find parts to keep the car running and that's our ultimate goal is to have a car that we can keep running i know where you can find parts that's a whole other conversation and (laughs) i think (laughs) i'm putting myself i was out at a cars and coffee last weekend and there were some you know kind of 18 to 20 year old kids and they were driving some interesting stuff and we all forget the whole hot rod culture was basically built out of taking mass-produced cars and making them your own right and now we revere that when people kind of shit on kids who are doing things with Subarus, it's like, it really makes me angry because here are these kids. It's like, they don't have a lot of money. They're probably working a, you know, a Starbucks job or something like that. And this kid had, a, did, did any of y'all know what an Alfa Romeo Milano or a 75 is? It's kind of sure. like a family car, but it's got a V6 Busso engine that when you tune it up, right, sounds like a Formula One car and a right. transaxle drives like a dream they raced them back in the day so it's got some pedigree and you can get one of those for like seven or eight grand what a cool car for a kid to have it's unusual it's different they get to learn about the history of a different mark that they may not have been part of i don't care what you're into if you're into cars we're all down for it and that's what i love about cars and coffee is like guys rolling up in two hundred fifty thousand dollars supercars parking right next to these kids that i'm talking about that have five thousand mm-hmm. dollar cars like I, I talked to a kid who he was 15 and he had with his dad's help he had helped him rebuild a corvair 
And, uh, oh, wow. you know, it's like, I want to give you a hug. I, I wish I, at 15, this I is giving out free hugs now. Can you believe it? Free <laughs> hug, baby. It's, the, it's that drink. It's that adult drink he's got. Mm. It's half a Negroni. Uh-huh. See, it's half, half a Negroni. Negroni. <laughs> I really don't, wanted to hear Don't hug kids mouth. at Cars and Coffee. Just don't do it. <laughs> See, your Cars and Coffee are very different than ours because ours are full of new age Mustangs and Camaros. Like, I, you know, I don't get it. Mm. I kid, I kid. There definitely is a car culture in Portland around, you know, that they like to bring the oddities out. You can find, you know, early 70s two door BMWs and other really kind of interesting stuff out there. It's kind of cool. The last time I visited Portland, I was shocked by the number of VW Type 2s, Squarebacks, 411s, all that kind of stuff, you know, station wagon culture for sure, and in vans. And I'm like, wow, this is awesome. But I also have to remember West Coast, they don't rot like they do here on the East Coast. So for us, they're like unicorns. But out there, it's like, wow, amazing, still on the road. To go back to Brad's point about what Gunther was saying, he's 100% right. And I will not try to imitate his German accent. Uh, no, <laughs> so Gunther, it. if Gunther, if you're listening, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but one of the things he did say, if you're looking pre-war specifically, let's start there. He said, Model A Ford is a great place to begin your journey in that genre of classic or collector car because to brad's point they're mass produced parts are everywhere you won't break the bank it's when you get into the packards and some of the duesenbergs and all that stuff you have to build your way up to that you can't just walk in and say uh yeah i'll take that stutz over there have a nice day i mean maybe you can but the pre-war cars they're getting tougher and tougher you know to deal with but they're still really cool i've driven some of those cars they're as fun as something modern but in a different way right so it really depends on what gets you excited So why don't we move to the heyday and go back to Chris for a moment and talk about the 50s and 60s. What have you got? What's a what's a suggestion outside? The Milano's really modern, right? That's a late late 80s, 90s car. Yeah, 80s generally. You know, if you're looking for something earlier and I'm going to focus more on the European side, like in the 50s and 60s. That's affordable. That window is narrowing pretty quickly, especially if you're kind of limiting it to the below 50k but from my standpoint i like smaller cars kind of underpowered cars in many ways like my julie is a 1.3 liter and i took it out on a tour and i like everybody else was having a good time but i was working i was driving the same speed as they were but i had to work to keep that 80 horsepower kind of up with traffic right that's what i kind of skew towards so there's like a really cool kind of a little bit off the radar called an abarth record monza really cool little car They're a little bit higher in there, right around the late 50s, early 60s, and they come in at around 80K. They're really cute and unusual. They're fun. They've got a race pedigree, but they aren't like overpowered either. They're four-cylinder, but they rip tuned up. They've got hot cams. They've got really tight suspensions. Pretty nice looking cars. So, you know, if you're looking like in the 50s, I would look at that or maybe like an Austin Healey 3000, something in those ranges. But you're still talking like around 50K. And I, I want to offer people who are listening to this like kind of like a, a lower level. And I think if I was really pointing to something European, I really dig Triumph TR4s. Those are cool convertibles, great proportions, fun to drive, beautiful not common, but not expensive either. You can probably get one for 20, 25K. You know, I'm an Alfa Romeo guy, as you've all deduced. And I really am a fan of the earlier Alphas from the 50s are really cool and iconic. But again, their prices are going up out of the reach of what someone might want to do for their first classic car. And 50s cars can be a lot if you aren't really up for that. So I kind of steer people into the 60s and 70s range of alphas, which are all the 105, 115 years. They all have common drivetrains. So there's three models. There is the Berlina or the the four-door sedan, the two-door coupes, and then the, the open top spiders. So you have three different distinct looking cars, but they're all on a common drivetrain. So parts are inexpensive and available. They're easy to repair. You can 
literally disassemble the engine with some wrenches and some Allen keys, and you can tear down the entire engine. They're bulletproof engines, four-cylinder chain drive, double overhead cams, lots of fun to drive, plentiful, unique, and available. Assuming they don't have Spica fuel injection. No, I recommend Spica. I disagree. Very cool. Well, then you Very can't say it's cool. easy. Then you can't say it's easy repair. <laughs> <laughs> you send them out to a guy it's named one Rusty. or the other. You you got to pick one. <laughs> Once you get them tuned, they just they they're pretty bulletproof. <laughs> They're really good, but you know, I'm, I'm a fan of carburetors, carbureted engines and stuff. Like my car has a Del Ordo. It's got a single Del Ordo, but most people have put a couple of Webers on there and they're, they're rippers. They're fun. And they're really great cars to drive super well balanced, but not overpowered. Chris, since you speak a little Italian, do you know what Del Ordo translates to in English? I believe of the of the forest or of the garden, garden yeah. which is a slight reference to being agricultural. So <laughs> <laughs> Lamborghini was a tractor company. Come on. Yeah, I know, right? But I was I thinking it meant being environmentally friendly. A car, a car motor, environmentally friendly. <laughs> Before I pass the baton, I do want to play off something you said about the Barth. I am a big fan of the Fiat 850. That's a cheaper version of a similar car. They came in a ton of different variants. You can mm-hmm. get into coupe and all this kind of stuff. I think they're, again, quirky. The one really neat thing about that car, people don't realize it's rear mounted, just like a 911. So you can have some really fun trailing throttle oversteer in those cars, but it technically doesn't have enough horsepower to get out of its own way, but still it'll put a smile on your face, you know, day in and day out. No, I, I think that's a great suggestion. Another great car. I mean, there there are different cars. I mean, some of them have just gotten so valuable that I wouldn't steer someone that for their first car, right? Yeah. You know, and like Porsche 356s, they're kind of fun. But well, since you brought that up, I'll put it to our other resident Porsche guy on the list here. What about the Beetle? He makes a grimace <laughs> when I say Beetle. I've had friends that are huge Beetle fans. It's almost a, a subculture in and of itself. It's like Beetles, Jeeps, they are their own culture. And it's like, at that point, what year do you buy? Do you just buy one made in the 90s in Mexico that's just a more recent copy of the 1960s or, or 70s version? Like uh, Everybody different. wants a split window. We all know this, right? They're only 100 grand. I mean, come on. <laughs> Exactly. But I think the Beetle is an entry level collector mm-hmm. car in a way. I mean, it is mass produced, but you can do really, to your point, you do really cool stuff with Beetles, right? I mean, I'm not saying turn it into a Myers Manx overnight or something extreme, but you can have a lot of fun with the bug for not a lot of money. So I think it fits maybe in that same category as the Fiat 850 or even the early 124s, which are more in the 70s. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. I want to give Rob an opportunity. You got anything from the domestic side of the house in the 50s that would be under 50K that would be good starter? You're having a little bit of a challenge on that because those cars are going, most of them are going over 50 that have decent ones. Your Fords are cheaper. Overall, Fords are less expensive, although their prices are coming up higher. See these crazy auction prices and Thunderbirds were used to be less than 50. Now they're going over 50. Depends on condition, all about condition. What's in the car and who built the car and all that good stuff. But I, I, you could probably get under 50 in a Thunderbird. I, I, I agree with what he was saying. The Thunderbirds are a great way to go, especially, uh, you know, the 57s, 55, 56, those are always a little... But I think if you get a square bird, which is a 58 to uh, 60, though those you can always get a real nice bargain on. You can even get the 61 to the 60, uh, 66. Those are pretty nice too. The, the To me, they look like a switchblade, but uh, those are pretty nice too. You can always get a nice bargain. And I guess I'm a sucker for this, but what is it that you like? You know, if you like the 57 Thunderbird, we can find you one for under 50. It's going to be over 20, I'm sure. But, you know, we can still find you one. It just depends on what you want. I had a friend back in the day. He had a 70 Charger. I remember thinking to myself, that to me is the ugliest of the three, the 68, 69, and 70. I prefer the 68. But I never liked that big lip mouth that the 70s had. I just thought those were kind of ugly. But I remember thinking to myself, why did you buy that one? Why don't you hold on and get a 68 or 69? You know, but I got to thinking they're basically the same car. Just go, enjoy yourself, have a good time. Don't get stuck on stupid little details and, you know, not enjoy the car. The 50s, 60s are getting harder and harder because the cars are going up. 
what is it that makes a, uh, a fair lane more collectible than a Falcon? Does it go back to what you were saying about the AACA where it has to be rarer, it has to be more expensive, it has to be more powerful? Okay, well, that would be a fair lane over a Falcon for sure. But I've seen a lot of Falcons out there that are just exquisite. They're, they're crazy. And you think to yourself, why would you put all this money into a Falcon? Oh, because I like it. Ah, there it is. Your recommendations for the 50s or 60s, I, I, God, there are so many different cars out there. Even if you go off the big three and start looking at other cars from Hudson, look at the cars from Willis, there's all these different off the beaten path manufacturers that really were results from coming out of World War II. Everybody wanted a car and there was this flurry of manufacturers popping up left, right, center. I'll tell you one that I think is off the grid, the two of them that always pop to mind is Mercury and Oldsmobile. Collector cars, oh, it's Ford Chevy. Bam, there they are. Then there's Cadillac Lincoln, you know, and then somewhere there's this Imperial guy off to the side. When you get down to it, it's always Ford Chevy, Ford Chevy, Ford Chevy. Then there's the Imperial guy. Then there's a the Chrysler guy, the Cadillac guy, the Lincoln guy. You rarely hear about the Oldsmobile guys or the Mercury guys because there are none. Because of that, there's a glut of cars out there that cannot find buyers because people don't think about them. You know, one of the cars I look at every now and then is a it's a 69 Mercury Marquis convertible. It's a great car. It's basically the same thing as a Ford XL. You've got the 429, you've got the four barrel, the, the C6. You got all the stuff to make it go, but it's thousands less than the Ford. It's a knee-jerk reaction. Get a Ford, get a Ford, get a Ford, get a Ford, or get a Chevy, get a Chevy. Well, wait a minute. Why don't we slow down? Let's go up a scale. What about a Mercury? What about an Oldsmobile? Yeah. You're getting more car for the money and it's less money usually. I encourage people to look outside of the neighborhood and see what you can find that way. Also led to Don's suggestion, Buick and yes. uh, possibly Pontiac and also go with the cars that are not the high-end models now. So like a Pontiac T37, for example, that's like 1970. But if you go back to like the Buick Skylarks, the Pontiac Le Manses, mm -hmm. the Oldsmobile, uh, not the 442s necessarily, but the um, Cutlass. The Cutlass, yeah. You can get those almost at a bargain rate. You, actually, Chris did a, a swap meet with me. There was a, a 1965 Buick Skylark convertible a guy was selling for $12,000. and It was in decent shape. Probably could have got it for 10000 I mean, a convertible, wow. that's only worth more money. I, I think that's where to go now. And the parts, you can still get the parts. I'd, I'd like you to know, throw I, in a quick plug, since we're talking about GM's dead relatives. They made some cool supercharged Oldsmobiles in the 90s. Yes, Just they saying, did. They were, kind of, they were kind of badass. Yes, they did. No, you're absolutely right. And don't forget the Quad 4. That's yeah, right. that was a tough little guy. It really was. I was going to ask, was that Buick Skylark mint green convertible? Or was it coming out <laughs> of the sack of suds? <laughs> To their point, I'm on Hemmings right now, and you can get a 68 Oldsmobile 442 for 40 grand. That's really good. Beautiful. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. Don's right. Everybody sleeps on the other bastard children of the, the GM and Ford. No Mopar love here, though. I don't... I don't... <laughs> Uh -huh. You know, it's funny. I love, I do. I love those old Chrysler, but my God, are they outrageously expensive. If they have a fin, forget about it. You know? I need Corinthian I mean, I to go... leather and Ricardo Montalban, okay? <laughs> and, and don't forget, in 1981, they reintroduced the Imperial, and they had to go a step above Ricardo. They got Frank Sinatra to introduce oh, that car. Lord. They went all the way out, baby. All the way out, you know? Get your three martinis. Let's go have some golf. You know, I mean, I like what you said earlier, Don, you know, the, you find a car that somebody spent an irrational amount of money on. I learned that lesson on my father's knee with his 72 Datsun 240 that you couldn't hold together. The thing just instantly rusted and fell apart. Like every time you put a new thing on it, it just turned to dust like Thanos snapped his fingers or something. But he loved that car. He put the money into it. And he sold it for a small, small fraction of what he put into it because when he sold it, it wasn't cool yet in the early 90s or whatever. For actually giving car buying advice instead of kind of taking the piss with each other. If I'm buying my first classic car, I would look for a car that somebody spent money on like they were going to give it to their kid and this was going to stay in their family for the next several generations. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And I, th I think that applies to any car you're going to get. I mean, really, try to buy the best of the best of the best that you can. Cheaper to buy a car already restored or highly worked on versus buying a, a pile of junk, so to speak. But there's a lot of people mm -hmm. that buy, buy piles of junk for VIN numbers. They spend hundreds of thousands of dollars because, because it could be a sentimental reason they're buying it, not because it's a practical reason. So what you guys are saying is the adage from racing, how to make a fortune in racing 
is to start with a large one is this is very much the same in collector car world, right? That, <laughs> that being said, it sounds like we ushered ourselves into the late sixties and early seventies without even really trying. So I got a couple of cars to throw out there that, you know, for you guys to chew on. One of them, a personal favorite of mine, and I kind of rediscovered it when the Clint Eastwood movie came out called Gran Torino. And it's specifically yeah. the Gran Torino Sport. I personally Sport. think it's the only good looking one because the Starsky and Hutch one is terrible. Many people will argue with me. Don's making a face. <laughs> oh. I'm a big fan of square lines and round headlights. You know, that's why I like M3s and other things like that. But that car has a really nice shape to it. It has nice hips. It has nice curves. I don't know what they go for, but that would be on my list to target if I was looking for a car from that era. I have just a story to add to that. When I was a little, little boy, the first car that my parents bought new was a Gran Torino. They kept it long enough where I got to learn to drive three on the tree in that car. <laughs> It wasn't one of the nice, but it was a, it was a six cylinder, but uh, still great car, super fond of it. Love it. I mean, that's like having a six cylinder challenger. I'd still be okay with it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Which brings me to another car that is out of the realm of possibility, but it's always been on my collector car list for that early muscle car era, or it's right in the muscle car era, really is a 70 challenger. Like you saw in vanishing point, like I fell in love with that car. It's nothing really to write home about in those days, but you're just like, Oh, it's so cool. You know? And, and so if they were below 50 grand, I'd be all over it, but for less than 50 grand, you could buy a Viper two years ago and it's a way mm -hmm. better car. But I do have one other one, and it's right on the edge of when things started to turn and the EPA got involved and safety started to change. And the National Which is Highway. Well. We're going to so judge you. Whatever you say next, prepare. I to will be stop at 1973 and say the MGB because that's before they got the ugly bumpers. <laughs> We could say that about the Porsche 914 also. A hundred percent true. You can fix the bumpers. That's not about. hard. That was one of my recommendations as a 914. I, I love 914s. And Eric, I have one to go along How much did you pay him that. to say that? <laughs> product placement. Product placement. Venmo me at. <laughs> well, I was just hanging out with this guy who is like the Porsche 914 king down in uh, Redwood City, California. He raced them and his whole business was he started road racing them and he'd go out and kick everybody's ass. And then all of them would come in and they would pay him to tune up their cars and then he would kind of keep that going. So I owned a Porsche 928, which we'll get to in a little oh, bit. Oh, I'm right there with you on that. So, so, hang, so we'll, put we'll a pin in that. that it's, we're not in that era yet, but... Any Porsche that isn't a rear engine Porsche, I love. Make two exceptions, the 924 and the 968. Those are garbage, but uh, the 928. <laughs> Don's face is priceless. Thought I could like you. I did. <laughs> the mid -engine I cars, thought we were going to have a relationship. They're, 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 like I had a Cayman, you know, it was mid-engine, but. I think that's a very rich scene because they're undervalued. Like the 911 rear engine, especially air cold, but now even water cold, they're the top performers and the ones that people splash cash on. But go get a 944, go get a 928. I promise you, you will. If you get one that's good and so you, if you drive like it a the lot, 944, what's wrong with the 968? They're just ugly. Oh, no, no, you have blasphemed. <laughs> Eric, Eric, can we so, kick, so can we kick you gotta give ass? you have to give a better reason than aesthetics. Aesthetics is relative. The 968 yeah, is a good car. Good. The 968 is a perfect car. And the 924 is a great car, too. No, 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 no. I love those no. cars. It, it just looks like someone, there was a little baby <laughs> playing with cars, and they took a 944, and they were going, nye, 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 and they mashed it with a 928, and it's just That's 100% like, what they did. <laughs> I know, and it is just. Yeah, don't, don't you remember the ad? Don't you remember the magazine ad? And it shows the cars that are staggered. And the ad said simply, it has its father's eyes. Yep. Remember that? A hundred percent. And it, that was the 968. It just doesn't work for me. So so let's let's backpedal on this a little bit, right? Because you're, you're on to something. And we're going to get to this a little bit later on, too. The 914 is in the lineage 
of Porsche that is one of the true roadsters. So that is defined as a proper two-seater, no back seat. So none of these 911s with their jump seats or speedsters, they're not roadsters, right? So it follows the lineage of the 550 and some of these other vehicles. And there's another episode that you can nerd out on where Lee Raskin talks all about that along with James Dean and his whole history. But what I'm getting at is the 914 has been underappreciated for so long that it is a good buy if you can find one. Now, you're not going to buy buy a last year two liter good luck on a 914.6 that's out of the equation well, those are six figure cars yeah so you're going to get stuck with a 74 75 or 76 with the ugly rubber bumpers because of the ones that nobody wants because the early cars are either to somebody's point a race car or completely unaffordable that said recently we reviewed an article from forbes where they nominated the 914 as an up-and-comer in the collector world but i wouldn't vote for that on this list I'm with Don. I want to go for the weird one. I want to go for the oddball. I want to go for the 912, which gives me the 911 styling with the 914 power plant. Nobody mm-hmm. wants a 912. For good reason. <laughs> you know, I, I think I think your conversation is getting very, very interesting here. Because I'm a huge fan of Ferrari 308. I, I, I really am. It's the Magnum PI upbringing, I guess, but I've always loved that car. And I watched them just skyrocket in value in the last few years. Well, why is that? If you start to look around all the Ferraris, especially those V12s, and Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, you're kind of the resident Italian guy here, but the V12s, the flat 12s, they've all been going absolutely psychotic. Well, I want a Ferrari. I want a Ferrari. I'm going to go get a 308. That's what I'm going to get because I can afford a 308. I can go get a 308 now. Taking this back over to Porsche, 914's chrome bumper, 914.6, unobtainium. So we go get the next best thing, which is the rubber bumper. Everybody wants to call it ugly, but whatever, here nor there. But it's what I can afford. You see what I'm saying? So people get into the mode, and that's what's going to drive up the price of the 914 rubber bumper. Is everybody wanting it? What happened to the 308? God, the stories I could tell you about 308s I could have had. But everybody told me, oh, don't buy that. That's a shit car. You don't want that car. It's a terrible car. You don't want that car. They built too many of them. Never be worth anything. Blah, 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 blah. Well, look at them now. First rule of car buying. If Jeremy Clarkson says, don't buy it, buy it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But you want a Ferrari, can I interest you in a Mondial? Uh, But you see, exactly. Uh. (laughs) The Mondial and the 968 in a room and like birthed. The I mean, Don, Don's having an aneurysm. Don's, Don's going to have a heart attack because every car I'm we just say gonna is leave. ugly. He's I'm, like, I'm just going to leave. You. I'm going to go hug my Caprice and I'm going to leave. You know. <laughs> but what's interesting about the 308, I want to go back to that for a moment, right? That, like the 944, was the everyman's Ferrari, right? And the 944 mm-hmm. was the everyman's Porsche. It was affordable back then. They're still sort of affordable today. But the thing that is actually really obtainable, if you love the body style of the 308, and now because of gray market laws and things like that, you can get them. They weren't sold here, but there was a 208, which was a two liter turbo V8 that was available in Europe. And it looks exactly the same and nobody knows the difference. I'm sure Chris is too. I'm on some of these Italian car marketplaces and I see them all the time. And it's like 12,000 euros and you can have a 308 and nobody knows the difference right so i think they're kind of cool i think they're cool but they were so unloved that it's hard to find one that's even worth saving that's the challenge when you get into some of these oddball cars those cars in particular if they've been sitting around it's going to cost you five times what you paid for it to get it back on the road and kind of be operational so if you're doing it and you have a good one and someone who's loved it and driven it often, that's great. If it's been under a tarp in the back of a garage, run away, run fast and far. Yeah. Yeah, but Chris, this, this could bring you business. You should be encouraging people to buy these cars. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the business, buddy. Come on. Yeah. Sometimes I don't always think in my own best interest, but you know, just to pick up the thread of this. So I own a Ferrari 348, which is often referred to as one of the most unloved Ferraris of all time. I love them. Thank you very much. It, it is, though. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying. You, yeah, it but is. It's, it's true. One of those things that I had Porsche 928, which was unloved, and I had a, now a Ferrari 348, and it's unloved. I got it for $33,000, and it was very well maintained and very well loved. Oh, my God, what a bargain. It's got a ripping V8 last analog Ferrari, no power steering. It's got renowned for its steering and drivability. It's a phenomenal car. I'm 
it will be available on Bring a Trailer by the time this episode comes out. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so look I at, think one of the I, I think one of the best parts about the 348, though, aside from the price point, is if you're not in the know, it's one of those cars, kind of like the 968, that you didn't know what it was when it was coming or going. Because if you look at it from the back, if you're not a Ferrari person, you say, oh, look at that Testarossa, because it has those those grates over the lights. It's really wide. And from the front, you think it's a 512TR because of those fog lights and the grill and the way that it's scooped in the front. So you're like, you kind of don't know what it is. They're super cool because they are understated and they're pretty cheap. Now, granted, engine out is the service position to do any maintenance. Yeah, on and the vehicle. That's, the, that's the whole Ferrari scam, right? And I, and I kind of warn people off of buying Ferraris in general, just because they have these incredibly expensive by design. It was part of the business plan to have these engine out services to keep the service departments at the dealerships operational and yeah. and keeping the money coming in but the 348 we've kind of jumped out of the era that we were talking about yeah, yeah. i bring it up only because it was in the because you're selling the, it the, the, the 914 but that particular car it's less related to a Tessarossa or even a 328. Its actual big brother is the f40 it's got the longitudinal engine it's like an unturboed F40. Now it's yep. got a little bit lesser parts, but it's got the same layout and a lot of the same drivability and a lot of the same, there's a lot of common parts between them. And the fact that 308s and the 328s are cool, but one of the problems is they aren't cool in a literal way because the radiators are right in front of the driver's compartment. And in the summer day, you just get heat bombed out of them. So in the 348, they moved them back. That's why the, the, the strakes are on the side. Great car, really fun to drive. And, and I think that's a philosophy that I have is like, go for the little oddball like you guys were talking about where it's like a little off the mark because you get like 98 or 99% of the car for probably sometimes a third or a quarter of the price of the one that everybody aims at. So I'll throw a couple other. So now we're in 1968 to 1974, right? We're sitting in that era, the pre malaise era, which Don will define for us here shortly. The other cars that we've overlooked are entries from BMW, like the 2002s, but also the Audi 100s. They also get overlooked, right? They had some Audi 100 coupes back then, you know, predating the famous UR Quattros and all that. And those are out there. I've seen some popping up on Instagram lately. And also you mentioned the 308 and 328. We're going to go back to that again. And they're the big brothers of the Fiat X19. So that's another underappreciated car. It's not fast by any stretch of the imagination, but if you want an affordable version of that with plentiful backing, because they were raced forever and there's a big subculture for X19s, that's another car to look at. To piggyback on that, which is the Lancia Fulvia rally car with a, it's really interesting. Have you guys ever seen one or been around them? The engine is all cockeyed and rotated over to lower the center of mass. And they're incredibly good cars and they're very unappreciated because Lancia, especially in the US, was never that big of a deal or very well known. So I'll just throw that one in there as a, another one. One of my favorite cars in that era, the, the BMW E9. Before bringing a trailer, I got ruined. I used to look at those things and they were, most of them were in Portland. And I mean, I haven't priced one in a while. I hope they're still under 50 grand, but they were pretty damn reasonable. Beautiful cars yeah. too. Beautiful. Yeah. And gorgeous. Like the proportions are great. No, they're not fast. At all. Well, everybody wants the CSL or the quote unquote Batmobile and that version of it, but why not just have the regular 635 yeah. and, or and, whatever and, the equivalent is? 800. Yeah. You can do an engine swap and then you don't feel guilty if you do something interesting with it. Like, what the hell? I mean, I, I guess if I'm if I'm giving legitimate advice, don't feel bad about being basic. Four tur- everybody aspires to buy a rental car. I've said it many it's times. Like if right? you like us, if you like a '69 Mustang or Camaro, then get a '69 Mustang or Camaro. Like, there's a million things you can do with that platform. You you can fix any problem you don't like. You don't like the interior? There's a ton of options. You don't like the the axle? You can, you can put an IRS kit in the back. You, you you can do anything you want with those platforms as far as you want to take them. You know, we've talked about everything that's from the stock point of view. We really haven't talked about modified because today people are modifying pretty much almost everything. I mean, you got your purists out there, but now we got a, a new generation mm-hmm. coming in here. And and even the guys in, in our older age range with the thing, well, how do I want to drive this car? And what comfort level do I have? Do I want to add air to it? Well, I'd rather shift versus a automatic when I shift my, change my transmission, put a five speed in. Normally they only have four speeds. And then I could drive them on the highway over 80 miles an hour. 
crazy rear ratios, like 411s. Can't drive those things unless you have a an overdrive, right? Yeah, on the highway, it begs to mention that, you know, we might want to look at, consider that as well. And that's going to probably will affect the value. Obviously, nowadays, they you see these crazy cars going at auction that are higher than stock value when they're highly modified. You got 502 cubic inches, probably with the supercharger. You got six gears or you, they're using T56s in them now. You know, anything's possible. But I would go back again, like we were, with Don, Don, we were talking about before, if you don't have to get a Camaro, get a Firebird. I am a Firebird junkie. I don't mind Camaro. I think they're okay. But Firebird and Trans Am have always just, you know, again, it's that white trash, Smokey and the Bandit upbringing, I guess. I but uh, if you're gonna get a, if you're gonna get a Malaysian muscle car, you might as well get a Firebird. Like, are we moving like, in? Are we totally. moving into the late seventies now? Let's, are we going let's, there? Let's do let's it. Let's do well, it. You don't I'm have to. You don't have to. You know, it was funny. We were talking about your Challenger earlier. You're talking about your Challenger in 1970. And it's really funny because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking to myself, give me a Trans Am any day of the week, twice on Sunday. I don't care what the Challenger's packing. Give me a Trans Am. Again, it's personal preference. It really is. I've had a few Mopars. They're interesting. They're unique. I've never had a Trans Am. Just always wanted one. But, you know, the Trans Am first started 1969 with the first body style, first generation, but it was very limited. So that goes right in your hand of what's a collector car. Anybody who knows GM muscle cars, anybody who knows muscle cars, I'll tell you right off the bat, the original 69 Trans Am is one of the absolute crown jewels especially if it's one of the seven or eight convertibles that were built and it's seven or eight because nobody can agree. Was it seven? Was it eight? Nobody really knows. It was one or the other. Obviously, if you have a car, one of seven or eight built, you know, you kind of won the bet. Why not a Tempest? Not a GTO. You can make a Tempest into a GTO. And I know everybody wants to judge, right? And all that stuff. And and here's kind of the funny thing when you're talking about Pontiac, when when you go to Tempest, before John DeLorean snuck the GTO into the back door, GM wanted it killed. They thought, nah, we're never going to be able to sell enough of these things. Get rid of this stupid GTO. I don't want to hear about it. We're going to get a lawsuit from Ferrari. It's just not worth it. And DeLorean made it what? An options package for the Tempest. Well, I don't know exactly how it went down, but there was the Tempest 326 HO. And not many people know about these cars. And they were literally, it was a high output 326, four barrel, the whole nine yards, heavy duty suspension. Basically, it's a baby GTO. But I want to say in 1964, they built 3,800 of those cars or 4,200 of those cars versus 33,000. GTO equipped Tempests. But the question is, where do you find them? A lot of people that have Tempest, they don't even know that they have the HO or the, the Lamont. They don't even know that they have that HO package. They just know that they have a really cool old car that looks like a GTO. They have no idea what they've got. You know, that's one of those funky cars that if you really start to look again, we're going back to, hey, buy a Mercury, buy an Oldsmobile. Okay, fine, buy a Pontiac. The Bonnevilles, holy cow. I mean, those, that's like buying a Cadillac. Those things or are Grand Prix, right? Oh, the Grand Prix are nuts. Yeah, those are absolutely nuts. And, and it wasn't long ago. I want to say it was a 72. It was a Firebird, and it was white, white with a 455 and an automatic. But it was a Firebird. It was not a Trans Am, but it was a 455. And I thought, I didn't think that they built that. I really didn't. So I started looking it up, and no, they did. You could have had it. They built something like 1,200 of them. We're talking the Rockford Files Firebird, the entry-level right. Firebird. It was white, white, crazy color combination. Uh, you know, you don't see cars like this, but I think you guys are on the right path when you're trying to tell somebody what kind of collector car should we buy. Chris, we can talk Ferrari all day long, but you're right. Trying to get one of these things serviced is going to put you in the poorhouse. Just the tires alone can put you in the poorhouse. You got to be really careful. You know, there's a Ferrari I'm looking at, the 456. 90s new millennium kind of car so it's out of this conversation for the moment but my god are they a bargain they're a v12 front engine and if you can find a stick shift i like the stick shift the price goes up quite a bit but even the automatic why not get the automatic i come from la back there it was all automatic you wanted an automatic because you don't want to be in traffic working that clutch all the time but the 456 is just under the radar it has little inherent problems but they're all fixable They're all very, very fixable. And once you fix them, 
from what I understand, you got a pretty bulletproof car. And in terms of being part of the Ferrari family, they're super, super cheap. There's your oddball for Ferrari, I guess. Yeah, the 348 is kind of an oddball too. Could that, that, I think, slips away from even the 355. It's almost like the 348 is kind of the forgotten little V8 child. The 456 is kind of the same thing. Now, going back to the Pontiacs, the Oldsmobiles, et cetera, where's that 326 HO? What, what, what is that? You mean the GTO? No, 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 no. It was the Tempest 326 HO. Nobody knows what this is, but you know... When you look closely, good old GM, it's going to have a brother, and that brother is going to be something from Chevrolet. Oh, could it be a Malibu? Could it be a Chevelle, a Malibu with a big block? We don't know. You just really have to start digging if you're not going to go pay the high dollar for a Trans Am or the high dollar for a Camaro Z28, something like that. Maybe I'm wrong because I've been watching the Trans Am, the prices are going up, but I think they're still in the shadow of Camaro. I think you're still getting a bargain for what you get with the Trans Am with the Firebird. And you think about it, out of the gate, they were marketed to a more upscale crowd. So they had a few more amenities. They had a few more little niceties to them that made them just a little nicer than a Camaro, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So as we've said before on this show, as the music changes, so do the cars. Music changed in the mid-70s into the height of disco, so came the malaise era. Don, would you like to briefly define for folks that might be hearing this term for the first time what exactly that means? You know, honestly, I have trouble defining it. I really do, because I own all of them. To me, they're mainstream cars, man. I hop in them, I drive them every day. I thought it was French for shit. Is no, (laughs) I did I read that wrong? Oh, you're probably correct. You're probably correct. It's resume. Correct. That's what resume. <laughs> it's French for shit. Resume. Yeah. <laughs> that being said, it covers the period between what is it, seventy six and like eighty two or eighty three, right? Like let me just seventy let, seventy three for American cars. Let me just bring it around the corner to you. Anything built in the era of Corinthian leather. Oh, nice. The Malays era <laughs> cup. <laughs> Speaking of which, I, I really think the Cordoba is the one that kicked that off. I, I really do. And when, when you start yes. talking Cordoba, it's like, okay, that's it. We're going out for cheap drinks and cheap, what are they called? Polyester suits, you know? I hey, mean, that's hey, that's hey, what hey, it's all about. My family you don't. Price, my leisure Cordoba. suit is legit. There's so much blah, but so much kind of awesome during this period. Because these are, the I think, the most unloved cars on the planet, like across every brand, like everybody went through this period of just like, it's like the dark ages. Yeah. The most important thing on the Malaysia era is gonna be what state you live in and what emissions regulation control framework you live under. Because if you can just rip all the reverse vacuum crap out and get away with that, then you can have some really cool, really awesome cars. Like if you're in California, like skip ahead in the podcast, just go like forward 10 minutes. That applies to all vehicles except for the Mustang 2. I just want to highlight that. (laughs) That is not good anywhere. For some good ones, not all. Oh, (laughs) man. Two men. I just say anything that's good enough for Farrah Fawcett is good enough for me. Okay? That's all. Including Vietnamese anti-aircraft guns. <laughs> this is also the era where these unloved cars also picked up notoriety and fame through Hollywood. If you think about it, there's more cars from this era that are showcased mm-hmm. in TV and film than probably any other. If you remember, if you go back to I Dream of Genie, which is 60s, they all had Pontiacs in that show. If you watch Bewitched, it was all Chevrolet. You know, it's all about product placement. And yeah, that kind of had its beginnings right there in the 60s. But yeah, in the 70s, they hit it hard. They really had to, you know, to Mark's point, if you lived in California, just skip over and and go because they had so many restrictions. New York, I think, was the same way. You know, one reason I love these cars, a lot of people ask me about the Caprice. In fact, one of my wife's friends asked me straight up at dinner one night, so you're Caprice. Yeah. Why do you have that car? (laughs) <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, it was just a bam, you know, th- there was no sugarcoating at all. And Keep your car's you know, for me, name it was out a- of your dirty mouth, lady. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> come on, it was a Will Smith reference. Come on. <laughs> one cocktail, one cocktail. So one half right? of the groaning. Gets- this guy, man. <laughs> And just so you know, I'm drinking coffee. So if I start talking more and more fast, you can just do this and I'll understand. Okay. 
but no, one reason I love those cars, and this this sounds like some sort of a cop out, I guess, and I don't mean it to. I really, really do admire these cars from this era. We went from 455s, 426s, 427s, all these wonderful engines having billions of horsepower to the 455 was reduced to 230 horsepower. Uh, I mean, it was just pathetic. Uh, <laughs> but remember, they had to adjust the way they were taking their horsepower figures. They could no longer rate it from the flywheel. They had to rate it from the wheels. So that lowered everything. Then you had the lower compression. Then you had the gas. Then you had this. Those cars, to me, are like the lab rats. You know, to me, they're like the heroes of the animal kingdom because these are the ones who... You know what? We don't have horsepower. We can't go fast. You know, Smokey and the Bandit is hysterical to me because he's doing burnouts and he's doing this and he's doing that. That car does not move like a Lamborghini. I'm sorry. It just does not. And if you've driven one, you know, the first time I drove and it was beautiful. It was a 78. It was a full Bandit package car. Eric, you know my Fiat. The guy wanted to trade for my Fiat. That was his thought, plus cash. And I, you know, I'm thinking, oh my God, this is my shot to get a Trans Am, blah, 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 blah. I drove it and I remember thinking, okay, so it's a little bit quicker than my Fiat, and I'm going to get a lot worse gas mileage. I got to tell you, too, and I hate admitting this because I do love Trans Ams. You close the door, it sounds like a busboy lost his tray. The T tops, the guy admitted to me, oh, yeah, 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 don't bring it out in the range. The T tops, they're going to leak like a sieve. Oh, my Fiat is a full convertible. It doesn't leak. Seriously, it doesn't leak. And no, my Fiat does not leak oil, but his leak that where the engine and the transmission come together, there's a main rear, seal. Rear main seal. Rear main seal. So I was going to have to fix that at some point. I'm thinking, holy cow, this poor car is just a beast, you know? So needless to say, the Fiat is still with me. My point is, this is where we started going from substance to style. Big screaming chicken. And let's take your Torino. You know, you like the muscle one. You like the one in Clint Eastwood's movie. And I love that car too. But that car can lay it down pretty authoritatively. Starsky and Hutch was another funny show because there's no way that Torino could have done half the stuff that it wanted to do. It had a lot of stuff. You had the wood grain dashboard. You had the beautiful grain of the vinyl seats. You had a vinyl top. You had all these wonderful things. Why? Because we can't give you a horsepower. So we're going to give you not only the malaise, you know, it's funny, whenever I write about these cars, I love calling them the Baroque period, because you've got <laughs> so much Baroque going on. It's a thickness, it's a heaviness, it, it, you know, it's like you're you're in some sort of a Frank Cannon TV show, and everybody's dressed in these drapes. It, it, it just, did, I'll did shut you up, say I know that's what you guys want broke. me to do. It broke for sure, Brad, broke Baroque for sure. Or broke? <laughs> the actually, sorry, the, the direction was going to luxury. Luxury was where they were emphasizing. Yes. Look at the Corvettes in the late 70s. They were dogs, but they're becoming more collectible. There's a certain thing about them. Tony, you're saying there's a certain feel you get about them that I guess that it's a charming thing about it. I, I got to learn how to talk more succinctly like him. Brutalist <laughs> architecture. But I have to agree with Rob because I have grown a newfound appreciation for the C3 Corvettes. It has to do with something he said earlier, which is people modifying the cars. And in stock trim, I'm not a big fan of the C3. I think it's plain, especially the one with the long butt versus the bobtail 427s. Those were cool. So you look at the, the long tail cars and I've grown more attracted to them because people are doing things like removing the chrome or lowering them or using modern wheels and adding modern touches to them. And now it's like, that's a cool car. Like, that's really neat. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's still 6.6 .6 liters of 200 horsepower of awesome. Not, <laughs> but... <laughs> But you can fix that with modern technology. You know, you put a, a sniper on there from Holly and suddenly you wake that thing up, right? Or, or whatever, cams and exhaust. And you're making 500 horsepower out of a motor that made 180. You said, you know, it was like this and that and, and the animal kingdom and everything in between. I hate to say these cars were neutered. That's really the term is they, they were. were. So it's unfortunate everybody did it. But the problem is your big four barrel 6.6 .6 liter Trans Am going down the highway got roasted by an 1100 cc honda cvcc precursor to the civic or a gti or all these hot hatchbacks that were suddenly showing up in the later part of that era so now it's like apples and chainsaws when we're talking about the malaise period because there's there's so much to choose from what's considered a collector during this period right well, a lot of and, and a lot of it's the, junk 
and the again, malaise car that wasn't the malaise car the 930 turbo which you used to be able to get yes, a 70s yes. 930 for under 50 grand no problem i feel horrible i had my friend's dad try to sell me his 1977 930 turbo for 25 grand like 10 years ago and i feel like a complete moron that i didn't just buy it <laughs> But you know what ruined the 930, but also helped the 930 at the same time? Because you saw a drastic price increase in those cars, even when they were available, was the introduction of the slant nose. Because suddenly everybody wanted one because the slant nose was the coolest thing on the block. Nobody had ever seen anything like that before. Yeah, I mean, yes, if you looked at that within the context of the timeline, but like, I mean, you can look at the 930 turbo prices on bringing trailer or the price history that goes back. Some of the best ones depends on your definition best. You could absolutely pick up a, se- a malaise era, late 70s, mid late 70s, 930 that had a slant nose kit on it. And somebody had just coked out in the 80s or 90s. But then obviously it precipitously dropped in value. You can see price transactions in just two years ago in 2020, 2019 of those things going for 46, for, you know, $48,000. But the market recently is really dull. I mean, yeah. like it's, it's, it's 80 grand. I mean, it, it, it's crazy. there's some amazing cars from that era. If you look in Europe and other places, and I was talking about. 90- you leave Detroit, you'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and I was talking about 928s. I bought a ni- 1985 928 and I drove it 175,000 miles and it was my daily driver. Its cost of operation was less than a Honda Civic. I actually wow. costed it out and that is a fact. It's a hand-built supercar. It had a Mercedes. That was the first year of the 32 valve in America. Yes, the S. Yeah. Very good. Well done. Five liter. And um, yeah, they didn't get that in Europe for a few years. Yeah. I had an automatic. So it was a transaxle. It was a Mercedes Benz unit in the back. I could fit two bicycles in the back, make Costco runs, leather seating, powerful, made all the right noises, drove like a dream. And I recently had a chance, uh, I'm friends with Keith Martin. He bought one down it and I flew down and picked it up and drove it up the coast and fell in love with it all over again. It's You can get one of those for 20 grand and right. get a good one. Make sure you've got someone that you can take it to who really knows what they're talking about with those. And they are bulletproof because they were built to replace the 911. They were horribly over-engineered. Their oil changes, the recommended service was every 6,000 miles, every 10,000 kilometers. They over-engineered this thing. So it really lasts. It's a solid car. You know, I can't emphasize enough. It was completely hand built in a supercar. And I remember seeing them on the cover of Road and Track. And when I picked one up for $13,000, I couldn't believe my luck. And Mm -hmm. amazing. The thing about that lineage, right? Because everybody, you know, nowadays likes to say, well, the 924 is a Porsche. Sure, because it's got a badge in the hood, but it was supposed to be a Volkswagen. And then politics got in the way and then it evolved 944, 928, and so on. The thing about it is. The 928 came way before any of those, by the way. It was in the early 70s. Yeah. Yeah. The the, the bastard metamorphosis of the pacer, right? Let's say where the 928 got its inspiration from. That aside. This that aside, that, aside <laughs> that aside, what I'm getting at here is they share a lot of parts with Volkswagens. So the people that had 944s, as an example, that kept them affordable, that didn't become the mechanic's dream and you were paying their mortgage through every week you needed to take it to the shop, you started to realize... Well, hey, this part can be cross-matched on a Scirocco, which is the same part on a, on a Rabbit, and it's this and that, or, oh, this one's off a Dasher, like all this weird stuff, because they grab from the same parts bin. Like, I know they try to play off today the common platform and all this stuff between VW, Porsche, and Audi. That's been going on for a very long time. So to your point, the 928s can be really affordable when you understand that part of that motor is derived from a Volkswagen, right? And all these other parts come from different places. There are things that that are you with the 928, but you're you're exactly correct on the 924 and 944. The yeah. 928 is a kind of its own beast, but it isn't as expensive to maintain. I think that's the real point. Yeah. And the parts are pretty plentiful. There's a lot of great suppliers. And they sold a lot of them. I mean, it was supposed to be the next big GT car, right? It was supposed to, like you it, said, it replace the damn near 20 years. Ever. They yeah. sold it for almost 20 years, 77 to 94 or something. I mean, 
so yeah, long time. In, yeah, the, well, the, you got to think too, as a, as a marketing standpoint, the 928 suddenly lured people who might have gone to Mercedes or BMW, all of a sudden they're going to a Porsche because they have a proper GT car. This is a car you can take to the country club. This is a car you can take to the boss's party and not look like you're some sort of rebel router in a 911. The 928 really opened up a whole new door for Porsche. Frankly, I thought it was the best Porsche that was ever made. I really did. Kind of going back a little bit, by naming off the 930, the 928, and even the little 944, 924, let's take that malaise era. You've got some bright spots. Take my little Baroque cars, like your Cordobas, like your Caprices, whatever. Those are okay. They are what define the malaise era. But then you have these bright spots that were born, like your 928, like your 944, like your 930 Turbo. These were cars that came out and blew people's minds. They were, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. You got a Porsche that does 0 to 60 in five? Come yeah. on. Who does 0 to 60 in five? My Trans Am takes 10 seconds. Well, yeah, that's because it is what it is. You know, where are the bright spots in the Malays era? And going back to the main point, if you're buying a first collector car, we can't really in good conscience say, oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go go buy a 930. Oh, yeah, they, you know, pop out 100 grand, 200 grand, whatever they're going for now. You know, the 928, I think, is a great place to go because, again, bias, I love that car, but it is one of those bright spots. You know, this is going way to the extreme. Kuntash was born right at the beginning <laughs> of the Malays era. It, it, Look at them it, now. To build on that, one of my other recommendations, like for the what should I buy is uh, Lotus Esprit. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, a Lotus Esprit. The the early ones are pretty cheap still. They're like 25K yes. and they look, they have Countach-esque looks. I mean, I think they they're do. beautiful. That box. Yeah, they're like a baby Countach. James Bond one. And the, the other one that I really love out of this era that is really affordable and probably one of my top picks for people who are looking for like something to have an experience of a collector in classic car is a Gen 1 RX-7. They came out in the late 70s. Those were cool cars. I think it's still a great design today. The rotary engine, they're really weird, but man, they rip. They are cool. They sound cool. They are fun. Get a good one and you can get a good one for under 10K. You will mm -hmm. get the full experience and you'll show up at Cars and Coffee and you'll have lots of people talking to you. Absolutely. Seek out the bright spots. You know, I can talk about Cordoba all day long, yeah. but what were the bright spots? What were those little glimmering, you know, moments of, you know, you brought up the RX-7. Holy cow, what a car that was. I mean, that was just, bam, there's style, there's flash, there's power. It was a great car. It's, it's, it's a little cheating. It's a little cheating in the sense that we're like when we're doing 90s cars, realizing that some of the best 90s cars were made in 2000, 2001, 2002, and some of the best 80s cars were made in 79. It's like you can pull in the Saab Turbo, you can pull in the RX-7. You, I mean, but those are 80s cars spiritually. I agree I mean, with that. I have a hard time counting a first-gen RX-7 as a malaise car. Technically... It's 77, man. Like 1977. That's the hard. Yeah, but there's this. 79. 79. Yeah. It's the bright spots. Look for the bright spots. Okay, Look for the bright sure. spots. Don being positive. I want to argue. 19, 19, yeah. <laughs> Two men enter. 75, 79 Buick is when they came out with the Regal Turbo, which eventually ran, became the Grand National. Oh. Then you had intercooled turbos, and that was the fastest car, faster than the Corvette. In 1986. And that and builds perfectly, Mark, on what you were saying. Some of the cars from the 80s came from the 70s. Some of the cars from the 90s came from the 80s. There's that Buick that popped up. Yeah, all of a sudden it became an 80s icon with the Grand National and, of course, the GNX. You know, everyone knee-jerk reacts to Grand National, and that, that's fine. Then there's the T-Type, the little brother. Nobody even knows about the LeSabre T-Type. And right. it it's a turbocharged T-type. It had the little Grand National logo on it. It was all blacked out. It was just a bigger, more luxurious car. But this is a car that could still hustle from zero to 60 in right around six and a half seconds. Now, I don't care who you're talking to. Six and a half seconds in the early mid 80s. Damn, you're that's bucking. moving. Luxury. And you're talking about a big grandpa Buick. Don, I thought you were going to go at one point, you know, to the height of the Malays era, maybe mention cars like the Stutz Bearcat. I mean, you can't get classier oh. than that. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't love those cars? Those are the best. And I'll tell you something, the Latin, not that anybody cares. I know here I go again, me and my Elvis crap. But the last photograph taken of Elvis Presley was him driving into his estate in his black Stutz Bearcat. 
I mean, there's something to be said about that. They were the height of the malaise. You're right. They were the absolute gaudiest, most baroque car you could possibly have. The gauges were gold for crying out loud. You know, the trunk was fully lined in shag carpeting that matched your interior. I mean, it went on and on and on with these cars. Were they fast? Were they quick? No, they were typical GM. They G-body, could, they were, Monte they Carlos. Were, I mean, they weren't anything special. Yeah, they were wheezing their way to 30 miles an hour and you felt good when you got there. And yet today, people still like to make fun of them, but they're slowly coming into their own. And what I think is funny about that, the people I see who are most interested in them are in their late 20s, early 30s. I'm blown away by that. It's not guys my age. I would love to have one, but I'm weird. But everybody I see who's really interested in those cars, late 20s, early 30s, or maybe up to the mid 30s, and that blows me away. When you ask them, what is it about that car that you like? And it's just what you said, Eric. Oh, it epitomizes that era. But are they buying them ironically? I think they are. (laughs) I think you're right, Chris. I I aspire to be a pimp, so... uh, (laughs) I don't know if you know this, but pimping ain't easy. I actually got to see one in person at the Peterson on a, on a recent visit and it's down in the vault and, you know, I've only I seen it, 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 a urinal, <laughs> <laughs> but I will say this, it is gaudy in picture and it's ostentatious in person. You're just like, wow, this thing is ridiculous. And, and when you consider that car, I mean, pick a year that it was built, let's just grab 1976, $70,000. Yeah. seventy thousand dollars in 1976 yeah you had to be elvis presley to afford this thing you were the only one who could afford it Mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's astonishing the money that those cars commanded and isn't it funny that if i'm not mistaken those cars were assembled in much of the way the cadillac alante was put together they were assembled here sent over there assembled over there then sent back here and they were sold i mean that's a lot of money to be flying those cars back and forth no the stutz is something else it really is that car was something else and it was you're right it was the height of the malays era and they're cheap no you know when you really think about it they're not all that much money I have one so word. Cat, no sales on Brand Trailer. There's only one Italian car from this era that sticks out. Well, actually two. I will take that back. One is the Super Plain Jane. It's the Fiat 131. And not yeah. the rally version, the Avar. No. It's the Plain no. Jane one. If you dress that thing up, it's actually really cool. People, ironically, to Chris's point, will probably think it's a Lada because it's the other way around. You know, they <laughs> copied the Fiat's. But the other one that's understated was sold in the United States, and people might remember from the Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo movie is the Lancia Beta Monte Carlo from 1978. I personally love that car. It's that just miniature Ferrari, right? It's more affordable. It is more obscure. It has a pretty decent following. I'm sure Chris can probably back me up on that, but it, it's a looker and it has that almost DeLorean kind of front end with the panda bear two-tone grill and bodywork thing going on. I think they're neat. They don't appeal to me. I like the other launches, like the Lancia Delta that comes along a little bit later which we can get to. It's on my list, but... Um, Absolutely. Right, so we might as well dive headfirst into the 80s, right? Do it. The music changed yet again. I'm there for it. What era is the 80s? We're, we're the digital era now. That's where we are. Yeah. The beginnings really? of the digital era. When I look at the 80s, and again, I'm kind of going to focus more on the foreign, but I, I would say the C4 Corvette. Yes. Ooh. I'm a big fan. That's one of my favorite Corvette bodies. I just, I really think that's a... It's a little plainer, but, you know, the the things that I like out of the, and these are still reasonably affordable. It's like the Acura NSX. What a car. Came out in the 80s. Formula One Heritage. That's when Honda was kicking ass in Formula One. Really complex and interesting engines. I think they look great. They're creeping up around 40 now, but that's a lot of car for $40,000. I mean, Mm. a lot of car. And I've I'd get one of those any day of the week. Like a notch down from that is the Lancia Delta Integrale, which is a hot hatch, one of the early hot hatches. Really cool rally cars. Very cool engine. But you don't have to buy the HF Integrale. You can buy the 8-valve or some of the other ones. Like Chris Harris just bought one as a daily driver. And you you don't need all the extra bluff and bluster. You can buy a plain Jane one like we've been talking about. And they're just as fun. I think he said he spent like 8,000 euros for it. 
I mean, what a car for that kind of money. That's a very cool and very special car. So I'm all over that type of thinking, you know, getting those uh, yeah. those eight thousand dollar cars. And and I mentioned it kind of at the top of the show, but look at those Alfa Romeos from that era, the GTV six, the Milanos, and the seventy fives. I mean, they might not be as beautiful in terms of their design or aesthetic. Like they might not like totally catch your eye, but there's a lot of car under there. And if you want to spruce them up, you can and put some kits on there to make them look like rally cars or some of the touring car series. Like they ate that series up. They were some of the hottest cars back then. So they've got a cool racing lineage. So, you know, the NSX though, I think out of this era from an affordability entry way into like a really, those are exotic cars. I thought we were doing eighties. NSX was sold in America in 1990. That's true. It did come out in the 90s oh, I here. The, I thought they came out in still Japan. In, the- in Japan yeah. first. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm on. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to give you a hard time. On any you of your just choices. A, your you RX-7, know. not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> not good enough. I hate you. I'm going home. <laughs> Eric, I think you got to give Chris and Mark a show. <laughs> yeah, right? You got to give Chris and Mark a show. Cause that, that like, right there, people Judy. would pay to see that one behind the scenes okay. on Patreon for sure. But I'll say this, there are a couple of cars that springboard me into the eighties and they're not what you're thinking. And I'll just throw these out there and look for some church nods as collector cars, the Ford Capri and the Opal Manta also kind of forgotten cars because they're European cars sold here, you know, Ford, people go Ford, Ford. It's not the same Ford UK versus Ford Germany versus the U S I think those are cool cars, but we are getting into the boxy cars with round headlights era, which are starting to catch on. And I have to pose this question, the Mark one GTI, is it a classic or is it still just a shit box? Classic. It has to be a classic. You know how much a, a Mark one GTI goes for now? It's insane oh, these days. Too much. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to buy one. But you know how see, much they were going for? You have you know how much it costs to buy a decent one now? But when you, dollars. I I know, and I've seen them on Bring a Trailer. But here's the thing: being a VW Porsche Audi family, I get into an original GTI, and it does put a smile on my face. And I walk away from it going, "It's still the same shit box it was 30 years ago." Hmm. It didn't get better with age. There are better GTIs later. The Mark II is a thousand times better a car than the Mark One, but this nostalgia thing is driving the price up of the Mark Ones. I would say the Scirocco is more of a collector car than the GTI is. I was right? just going to throw that one out there, man. That I love those Scirocco's. I think those are cool cars. And they're the same chassis. I just got to throw it out there. Yeah, no doubt. I had one. Oh, the Scirocco's were incredible. I had a second gen. The second gens were awesome, but they were still carryover chassis. Unless you had a 16 valve, and that's a whole other story. Oh, well, yeah, right? it's different. Yeah. <laughs> A car that we've kind of overlooked here that, I mean, they're kissing cousins visually to the, know, uh, the I know Scirocco. where you're going. Oh, where am I going? I know where you're going. The Audi I Coupe GT. Going. Actually, no. But what? yes, you're correct. You're correct. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm trying to be nice 90s. to you guys. I'm trying to be nice. I'm letting you yeah, handle you, the, the Audi VW there? stuff, you know. I figure I'll let Chris handle the Italian stuff, you know. No, where I was going to go was the Isuzu Impulse. Another Tujaro uh, car. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Which little little known fact that was supposed to be the third gen Scirocco and it was a rejected design from Volkswagen. Wow. Mistake, mistake. <laughs> I don't know. The Corrado is a way better car. Corrado's is a 90s car and it was totally one of my 90s recommendations Tech- for the first time. So like- me, it came out in 1989 with the G60, but you know what? Who's counting? Somebody's counting. <laughs> I, so, I Tom was going to talk about the Shelby GHS, the, the Chrysler um, version. The Omni. The, the little Omni, Dodge right. Omni Shelby. Yeah. Thing was yeah. Like yeah. Well, and don't forget, they didn't just do it to the Omni. They also did it to the little Charger. They had that little yeah, fast that Charger that. back then. Yeah. 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 And then they had, the, they had the GLH and then the GLHS. GLH stood for Goes Like Hell. Right. And the S was Goes Like Hell Some More. So that, that, those were the ones that were really modified by Shelby. What they built, God, you talk about rare. They built what five hundred of them, fifteen hundred. They're disposable. Something. You don't see any. You don't see yeah. them anymore. But to your point, there's a lot of cars like that that are sleepers during this era because the GLHS packed a punch in a small package. I mean, yes. granted, the base motor was a Rabbit engine. They were collaborating with Volkswagen at that time. There's a lot of similarities. There's also cars that people salivate over from that time period that they don't realize are super rare either. To your point, 500 GLHSs. Let's look at the UR Quattro. 
right? You were talking about the, the Lancia Delta before. I owned one of these cars. We actually had two of them over the years and they only brought 627 of those to the United States. Wow. So they are ultra rare. And that was within a three year span. You want original Quattro? Go get a 4,000. They made a billion mm. of those. But if you want something super cool, go get a Quantum Synchro Station Wagon. I that is awesome. That's a collector car that nobody even thinks about. And that's an Audi underneath. Well, Mark is holding his head in his hands going, oh my God. Is that car really Volkswagen though? The Quantum was bodied by Carmen and VW, like all of them were, but it's a 4,000 underneath. It's the same power plant, drivetrain, everything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And the Quantum became the Passat. I don't know why. That whole period, the Rabbit and the Quantum, they made all these weird names up. I kind of wish Quantum had stuck around, but maybe maybe in the yeah. EV versions, we'll, we'll get it back. Well, shifting, you know, shifting gears here. And again, one car I really did want to bring up that is just starting again, and it's the younger people who are interested in them, the Lincoln Mark 7. I know... Eric, here I go with the Lincolns, but I am a Lincoln junkie. I love these cars. The Mark 7 was really, really something in its day. It was introduced late, late 83 for the 1984 market. If you look at it, it has the flush headlamps. No other car had the flush headlamps in 1984. They were not available. Chrysler will tell you they were the first one to have it. It's not true. It was actually Lincoln. The doors, they were cut into the roof, kind of like a 63 Stingray. There were all kinds of advancements that Mark 7 brought to the program, they had a console, they had true bucket seats, they had a floor shift. You know, this for an American luxury car was really, really, I mean, frankly put, it was just mind blowing because here you had everything people loved about the European cars, the bucket seats, the floor shifts, the doors in the in the roof, the flush headlamps, all these things added up. Damn, I mean, Lincoln really knocked it out of the park. And yet, not many people really noticed. If you were a Lincoln guy or a Ford guy, you looked at it and said, wow, oh, this is the wave of the future. And sure enough, if you watch Ford's history, if you watch all American car history, they followed the Lincoln Mark 7 and nobody wants to give that car credit. But that is one hell of a robust car, really a robust car. The five liter engine. Yeah, they had the five liter, the 302, but for 1984 only, they also offered a diesel which was built by BMW, and that was to meet the CAFE standards. Here we're talking about the GLHS as one of 500 or one of 1,500. I forget how many they built, but it's the oddball of the oddball family. That BMW diesel six-cylinder in the Mark Seven is always the oddball of the family. I want to say they did import something like 1500 and it was literally just to meet whatever the federal government required for cafe standards. And that was the whole reason they did that. And the funny thing is, they're not worth any more. In fact, people prefer the 302 because they're more familiar with it. They can get parts for the five liter. They don't know what a BMW diesel is. They're not comfortable with that. So even though it's much, much more rare, People don't care. Could potentially be a collector item. Strange and rare sometimes equal that person going, well, that's really cool. And I want to have 12 of those. Right. <laughs> well, and I think that's something to do with collectibles too, as collectors. One little uh, trait collectors have is they all want that something nobody else has. And that's where these cars start to become popular, like the Lincoln with a BMW diesel. That Audi, they only imported 532 of them, whatever. Unless you're an Audi guy, you're not going to know about this thing. You know, it's just one of those off the radar cars. And yet, because it's off the radar, you could probably buy one pretty cheaply. You are Quattro's not so much anymore. Those have gone okay. way through the roof. <laughs> yeah, and see, and that's the funny thing. The Mark 7s are doing the same thing. I'm looking at these Mark 7s and they're maybe not like that Quattro, but they are really starting to climb up. But anyway, I, I think that is a pretty important car. And that is a car that actually... When I do meet some younger people who are interested in buying some sort of a collector car, but granted, I have weird tastes. I, I'm not into going 500 miles an hour. I'm not into, you know, I like a car that I can get in, just enjoy. You know, you, you want to cruise to the beach, you want to cruise to the mountains, you want to cruise to your local resort, to the car you can do it in. Um, it, you know, if I want to have a fight, I'll go find an in-law somewhere, you know? <laughs> So what else is sitting in the 80s that isn't already considered a collector? Things like the UR Quattro that we already talked about, the DeLorean, it's already really a collector car. What are some of these wolves and sheep's clothing that are still sitting out there that a first time collector could be interested in? Is there something we're Where's overlooking? I mean, I, I gave Chris a hard time earlier, but I, I go back to the 85 928 just because it is a really great 
early example of relatively modern technology with the 32 valve five liter V8. They are underappreciated, undervalued. During this time, I wanted to mention to you also that mm-hmm. they said joint ventures started up like Callaway with a Corvette. There were certain models that were done aftermarket that they brought on. I think what was it? Chrysler had a, a relationship with Maserati. They had a, I can't remember the name of the car, but the TC. There you go. Thank yeah. you. And they didn't use Corinthian leather. <laughs> I want to drive one of those. I've looked at them and those are another underappreciated car, right? Motor by Maserati, drivetrain by then, designed sort of by Pininfarina and then Chrysler had their magic well, in there. And they came as a manual. So I'm like, I, I want to drive yeah, one. Be careful of that though. Be careful of that because some of them had, it was the head by Maserati, but the actual engine and everything else was Chrysler or Mitsubishi. Oh. So you want to be careful. You've got to get the actual one with the head by Maserati and the five-speed manual transmission if you want to go that route. Building on that one, the Cadillac Alante, that's kind of coming into its own. But one car that a lot of people forget about, the Buick Riata. Oh yeah, the little kind of bathtub thing. I think that's one of those overlooked cars. People are going to wake up and realize, oh my God, what a cool car this is. I don't know if it's going to go through the roof in price, but it is something that's overlooked. You know, it's in the shadow of the Elante. It's in the shadow of the TC. And I don't think Buick people really got into them that much because it was kind of out of the Buick scope. It wasn't what your traditional Buick buyer would go look for in a showroom. Oh, I'm going to go buy a two-seater, you know, coupe or a two-seater convertible. That's not your traditional Buick buyer. But I think that's another one. Well, gonna, I would agree. I would also say the Pontiac Fiero. Maybe not. Yes. Quite. I was just Brad's like, favorite car. You be, we should have had a Deadpool on how long it took for the Fiero to come up. Of course, of course. <laughs> well, I, I, I've got one that's Fiero adjacent, but is actually a good car. And that's the to- Toyota MR2. Yes. Um, yes. First gen is, yep. is a great cool car. Cool car, great car. I mean, if you want a reliable fun. X19, that's the thing to buy is an MR2. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It, um, and you could get it with a factory supercharger as well. I think that's a great car, it, but I don't want to crap on the Fiero. It's like a DeLorean in that I feel like that was a really ambitious and important car but not well executed. The running gear just wasn't as good as it should have been for what they were trying to do. I mean, the last couple of years of the Fiero, they really sorted it out. In the 90s, they got it right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and and, and let's remember one thing about the Fiero, like I think Mark was just saying, the last couple of years of Fiero, they were getting it right. They were getting it so right, in fact, that Chevrolet essentially told General Motors, you know, this is not the kind of club room we can have two-seater sport cars now, is it? (laughs) So Fiero was getting so good that Corvette was starting to get a little paranoid about it. You know, it was cheaper. It was fun. It was something everybody could afford. No, it wasn't going to move like a Corvette yet. Give it time. They were working on turbocharging. They were working on all-wheel drive. So this was going to become an animal of a car. We're going to get rid of it because sales aren't that good. Oh, yeah, right. Sure, sales aren't that good. Mind you, it's outselling Corvette like three to one. There's a lot going on in the 80s, right? And to the point of the episode we did with Mark, we discovered that a lot of really great 90s cars came from the 80s, right? They were born in the 80s and they, and they made their way, like the Fiero, same kind of deal. So they matured. They, exactly, they matured, like fine wines. But one thing we've kind of overlooked, we talked a lot about Italian cars, talked a lot about domestic cars, German cars, you know, in there, we, we focus a lot on VW Porsche Audi, not a ton on BMW because a lot of BMWs have already become collector cars. Mm-hmm. What we haven't touched on, except for that RX-7 and the NSX, are Japanese cars. They were late to blossom. They were late to the game, right? It took them a while to get ahead of steam. In the 80s, I think there's some really neat cars in there, but they fall into the hot hatch category, like the Starlet and the FX-16 and other cars like that, where they're kind of obscure. And when you see one, you get excited. You're like, wait, is that a Fiesta? No, oh, wait, no, it's not. It's, it's a Corolla, right? But I think they were still coming into their own at that time period, unless there's something that really jumps out during the 80s. Other than the AE86. I mean, but that's already a collector car. Well, I I think one thing we could all say, I I think we can agree on, you know, let's face it, BMW, the ultimate performance machine, Datsun Nissan came out with the Maxima and they started marketing it as the four-door sports car. And it had the 300Z DNA. It had the engine. It had a lot of the chassis components. And if you ever drove a Maxima, any of them, They really were something else. They were absolutely amazing cars. When you pit them against the more expensive BMWs, it was pretty amazing what a bargain you were getting. 
yeah, I'd like to throw the Maxima out there. I love Maximas. I grew up learning to drive on my friend's 4DSC, a little label they put on the side of all of the Maximas. But front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, it's a little apples and oranges from a platform perspective, in my humble opinion. No, you're um, wrong. No. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So much good fruit, right? We've talked about the first gen uh, RX-7. You know, I think that really matured in the 80s. Obviously, we're going to see the sales volume where you're going to be able to buy one of those. The Celica, if you're up for that kind of challenge, I think, could be a lot of fun. There's one more, and I don't know that it's super desirable yet, but sort of is. Part of the reason people shy away from them is because they're a little strange compared to their cousins, the Civic, and that's the CRX. So even yeah, though they're very similar vehicles, their DNA internally is different. Like some things people don't know, the early CRX is the motor spins backwards and the Civic spins the way we all traditionally do it. There's all these oddities with the CRX and people go after the later ones, the Gen 2s and obviously the early roach looking Civics that came out in the 90s. Those are more desirable for autocross and track and things like that. But those first gen CRXs, they're really kind of awesome cars. I had the privilege of driving one that was modified for Pro Solo. It was a fantastic vehicle and they get forgotten. Oh yeah, the CRX, forgot about that car. It goes back to the point of the Japanese at that time, I think were still coming into their own and didn't come into their own until the 90s. So maybe we we need to cross that threshold and now kind of quickly discuss some of the cars maybe we didn't talk about during your episode, Mark, in the 90s. Sure. If I'm giving, you know, legitimate advice, someone getting into this ridiculous hobby, you do have to kind of think a little bit about goals. You know, what are your goals to yourself? Are you getting into this to enjoy a car, but like you ultimately have some longer term goals. So you want something that is either going to, at the very least, hold its value, if not grow in value so that you can turn this around over time and grow the amount of money you're investing in cars. I personally did that. You know, I buy a car that either appreciated or didn't, at least didn't depreciate. I paid off. I take that, I roll it into the next car, and now I could buy a car that was twice as expensive. You know, from that perspective, you do have to maybe factor in some of these other considerations. This is your first car and you have some other kind of more aspirational goals. Then you do have to think about kind of where the market is and what's becoming popular. Then once you get into the 90s, it's a really interesting market because the 90s teenagers are starting to come into their peak earning potential from a macroeconomic perspective, right? And so the values of cars traditionally kind of track relative to the earning potential of the age that that person was 18 years old or whatever. And so that's why you, you see cars peak and then start to trail off. You're just starting to get into that. We've talked about good options I kind of personally disagree on, on the 968 uh, perspective. I like that car. I see it as like a really the most mature 944 if you're not going the turbo route. So you have to think about how much the car market has changed in the last couple of years. You used to be able to pick up that 348 for below 50K, that 456, I think that Don was talking about earlier. Although any ones that would have been in your 50K range were automatic 456s. So meh. If I had to land on a recommendation, your first car collector, we've talked about it a little bit already. I really like the Corrado. It's a very 90s look. It really is the epitome of the 90s. You can put some turbo twist wheels on it. The bolt pattern fits. They look the sex. It's a cool car. I'm a little actually personally impartial towards the supercharged four-cylinder. I, I, the VR6 is more valuable in the market. Even today in this kind of crazy market, if you look at bring a trailer prices, which are always kind of inflated, you can find a better deal than bring a trailer if you're willing to work your market and work your area, take your time and, and shop for something. They've been selling Corrados. You know, they have, I think, three transactions this year that are all like sub 20 grand. And those are VR6s and some other things. And so I'm going way below the 50K target. You know, I'm thinking about myself when I was 27 years old and I was first buying my first collector car. I went with an 80s car. I got an, a really nice 85 Carrera 911, but that was back when everybody hated the 80s 911s. I got it for 20 grand. It was an amazing car in amazing condition. And the guy had a ton of money into it. You'll find a very passionate Corrado owners 
that spent an irrational amount of money on their car in the nineties. If I had to pick one, that's, that's probably one that I, that I could lean on. There are a ton of others. As I said earlier, don't be afraid of being basic. Don't be afraid of a Fox body Mustang. If that's what you like, you can find somebody that somebody dropped the fortune in, you know, you'll still get beat by Tesla at the drag strip, but it's really cool and a lot of fun. There's a lot of, a lot of different options out there. Oh, I already gave you the NSX. Okay. Apparently, so <laughs> Your best 80s car? Uh, got it. I got, I got Time Shame by Time Cop Mark. <laughs> Time uh, Cop. I have that game. Eric, it's a great game. Eric, I'm, I'm telling you, Eric, you've got a fortune in Mark and Chris. You have a <laughs> fortune. Give them a show. Make Sitting a on show a gold mine, Trebek. <laughs> oh, my God. I can promote the heck out of this thing. Are you kidding me? This is going to be brilliant. <laughs> I mean, Mark is even drinking over there. He can't believe some of the crap that Chris is coming up with. He's just drinking. He's like, I can't take any more of this crap. You know? I'm going to give him a spit take now. So start drinking. Milk. I have two in the very, very, very different cars that keep my attention from the 90s. Do you remember the Ford Thunderbird SC, the supercharged? That was on my list. Yes. Sorry, I ripped. My I, uncle I, had I, one of those. It, the I Thunder Chicken. One. The Thunder Chicken. My brother had one and it, he never let me drove it, the jerk. But what a car. What and remember, a- remember that car had a sister, the Cougar XR7. Again, if you're seeking Ford, you're going to pay a little more money. But if you know what to look for in a Mercury, you yeah. can get the same car. They made a five liter version of that, which you can find for like $5 in a McDonald's <laughs> burger these days. Yeah, no, <laughs> just go rip the engine out and put it in something like drop it into something else and it'll like blow your mind. Great, great, great car. He also had a Pontiac, like he had some sported Grand up Prix. Grand Prix, and I can't remember what the model number was for that. Hold on, the Grand Prix in the nineties, the Supercharger, the SSE. The Grand Prix also had a really special car from McLaren. It was the McLaren ASC Grand Prix, and it was a turbocharged. It was essentially a much more handsome, much more comfortable version of what a Grand National might have been. Very rare. Very few people even know what they are. Yeah, they've got flared out hips over the wheels. They're a little bit bigger looking, a little chunkier. I wonder, Chris, could that have been it? Or did you have the super? It, wasn't, it wasn't McLaren, but it was the, it, someone said it. I heard it. I just forgot the name. Rob. The SSEI, the supercharged SSE. Yeah, great car. Really great car. Yeah. GXP model as well, wasn't there during that time period? I think so. The GXP, yeah, the GXP, I'm sorry. Yeah. GXP. The SSE was the, the Bonneville. The, the GXP G- was the, G-T-P. yeah. Right. Actually, the one that I would really point people towards is uh, Gen 1 Lotus Elise. Yes. Generally think that's one of the all-time greats. But they didn't sell those here. You have to import those. And a lot of I know, people, yeah. you and I know what they look like, but, but they're not the ones I'm thinking of. Because uh, the time is, the clock is run out. You can bring them in yeah. with penalty. A guy brought one in from England. He was a, holy crud. I'll never forget that car. The handling... You know, it's got a Toyota engine. I just think it's a beautiful, beautiful car. And also it was the prototype for the Tesla Roadster. You know, they yep. kind of built right. You know, you right. pretty much use that. See, car. but I, w- I would take a step back. And if I'm going pure 90s Lotus, I would look for the last of the line before the Elise came out, the Elan, which is what they kind of spun off of. And the Elans are kind of wedgy and have that... 80 shape to them, but they're also really kind of cool. And there were some MGs and Opals that were very similar as well. And if you remember, there was a commercial in the early days of kind of the internet. So there was this guy and he would, you know, spin the car into the parking spot and it was in this little Opal convertible. And I'm not talking about like the Vauxhall VXR and the Opal that became the Solstice and all that. Precursors to those cars in the generation of the late Elans and stuff. Those are pretty neat cars that could be really collectible and very forgotten if you're looking British. Yeah, I think that's great. Lotus had, I'm pushing back a little bit on what you were saying, like they had lost their way a little yeah. bit. And like the Elise just like brought them right back to what Colin- What it should have been. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. I, agree. It's like I agree. Pure, lightweight, low power, but unbelievable handling. That was a really cool car. And I'll throw in last, Mark can call me on this. <laughs> it was the, I certainly will. What year was the Mercure or whatever they call that? Oh, the Ford Sierra Cosworth, the Mercure yeah, XR4 Mercure. Ti. Yeah, that was the 80s. The, that, that was the late 80s, 80s wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. That was a cool car, though. That's another Mercure. underappreciated car. Very underappreciated. Extremely. So, that's my 90s list. So I have one for the 90s that I think gets forgotten. 
because it was eclipsed very quickly. And I recently got to ride in one for an extended period of time and it reinvigorated the passion for one of these. And it's the first gen two and a half liter Boxster. Oh yeah. It makes mm-hmm. 200 horse, weighs 2,700 pounds. It's everything you need out of a two seat roadster convertible and they're cheap. Mm-hmm. They're very, Good. very cheap. Good one. You have to bring it the first gen ZR1 Corvette. It's a oh, yeah. bargain right now. Good bargain right now. Are they still cheap? They were relatively cheap for a long time. Yeah, they're still cheap. You know why? They're overlooked because people look at the C5s and 6s, but you know, it's a collectible item. And it was very expensive back in 1990 to buy a ZR1. It was double the price of a regular Corvette. 375 horsepower had a turnkey, so your kid couldn't get more power of like 200 normally. And then it goes with the 375 or 405 depending on the year. Uh, Remember when that, when that car hit the 405, that was the moment when Corvette absolutely went fender to fender with Testarossa and Countach. They were, and the, and the 930 turbo, they were fender to fender with those cars all the way. And yet they were so much cheaper. I heard a good one uh, back in the day. I'm going to go buy myself a, a Walmart Ferrari. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and they, they were referencing a Corvette, you know, you can't go wrong with one of those cars. You really can't. The only caution I've got with a ZR1 from that era is don't break that engine because there are no parts anymore. Oh, yeah. so those engines are, you know, unobtainium. Out of unobtainium, yeah. You do run into this situation very often where, you know, the aspirational, less expensive platform, and I'm not going to say American or this is true cross country, where they go up against the end of the older platforms and they mm-hmm. kick their butts. It's kind of really a shame in the zero one, you just the internal politics around GM kind of killing that car. Totally badass and underappreciated. Great one. You know, kind of building on that way off base here. I'm going to say this and you guys are either going to wonder what it is, or you're going to say, you got to be kidding me, especially Mark over there with his anti front wheel drive thing. But the Dodge Daytona IROC RT of 1992 that was a bear of a car and it was a little 2.2 liter four cylinder with a with a turbo and an intercooler the damn thing put out 222 horsepower and mark forgive me that front wheel drive because of it good god almighty you you could scare the bejesus out of trans ams corvettes mustangs all day long especially in the curves when that front wheel drive is just pulling you through they were brilliant cars there were very few of them produced Mm -hmm. and yet again there are none out there and a lot of guys don't even know what they are and if you go back to the 80s just like you're saying mark build on that platform i mean it was just a k car with a turbocharger yeah that charge that charger body that charger you mentioned earlier, the GLH charger, it's basically a derivative of that. Yeah. Right. It, it is the father of the Daytona. They shared the showroom for one year, I think. Then no more charger with Daytona City. So another one that was on my list coming from the VAG world yet again, nowadays you're starting to see the resurgence of first-gen Quattros and second-gen Quattro Coupes. And a lot of people, second-gen Quattro Coupes are like, what is that? You can go look them up. 1990, 91, they brought 1,500 of them. Some say 1,600 to the United States. We had three of them, so I can account for those. We still have one. They're kind of the epitome of the 90s, right? A big old just blob of metal on wheels, you know, like any Ford Taurus or contour, you know, all that same shape. The 90s, everything was a marshmallow, right? The bubble design cars, right? Cab forward, all that kind of stuff. And the reason I bring up the Intrepid is the first car with cab forward. Granted, the Chrysler Intrepid is not going to be a collector vehicle. It's not going to make this list. I just said it for fun. Now, going back to Audi, the car you should buy is not a second gen Quattro Coupe. You'll be disappointed with the whopping 175 horsepower that that 20 valve five cylinder puts out. Save your pennies. You only need about a hundred more and go buy yourself a 1994 Audi 90 Quattro CS. It has a 2.8 liter V6. It's a more modern suspension. They came automatic and manual. It's a better gearbox. A lot of other stuff that was just improved upon the same platform. Those chassis are great. Adding the V6, putting the wishbone suspension, all the other stuff that you take and put on a second gen Quattro is all there for you. And it's not that much more expensive. And the best part is it's a sedan, right? You're not dealing with trying to get into the back and the vault doors like a Chevy Beretta that, you know, the second gen coupes had all that kind of stuff. So that would be my recommendation for a saloon car from that era. That's interesting. You know, the Audi guy recommending you go from the classic inline five to the V6. 
Heck yeah. <laughs> and the other reason is you can put the four valve heads on there for the later sixes. You can do a lot of stuff with the six cylinder. There was an all aluminum three liter that you could drop in there. There's a lot of things you can do. More modern fuel injection in 1994 versus 1990, right? In the beginning, they had Motronic and then the, the later stuff came out. So it's just a better car waiting four years later for something way more modern. Now, if you really want to go extreme, the Cabriolet is what I would get if I was cruising around. Same body style, all the stuff I just talked about. Only difference is they came in automatic only, but that's really easy to swap out. Let me throw one else out at you guys. The Taurus SHO, the Yamaha engine. He's shaking his head. Yes. They were cool. Yeah, definitely. It was affordable. It was the poor man's Audi 5000. I mean, right. you know. It was it really was. You know, the SHO, again, Yamaha power, 220 horsepower out of the box, five-speed manual. It, it went into the 90s, you had the same package, but the availability of an automatic and a sharper body. Uh, now, the SHO was a fantastic car. And building on that and going into the Mopar camp again, you had the uh, Dodge Spirit RT, which was basically, let's take that Daytona's 2.2 turbo and put it into a sedan body. And again, Nobody knew. Nobody had any idea what this car was. It was a killer car. It really was. Now, going back to Japan, if I could kind of compliment you guys, Mitsubishi had the um, Galant, but it was a VR4 package. So you had the three liter V6 with the twin turbo, with the intercooler, with the five speed manual transmission. I mean, for the most part, it was a fairly conservative looking car. I think the SHO and the uh, Spirit looked a lot more aggressive than the VR4 Mitsubishi sedan. The Spirit was the one that was also offered as the Shadow and the Duster and like a million other names, right? It was the Plymouth Shadow and it was the Dodge Spirit. The Duster was a sub package to the Plymouth Shadow. So you would recommend that over the Neon? Not that I'm saying the neon is suddenly becoming a collector car because it's not, but I'm just asking. Yes. <laughs> Chris's yeah. face is amazing. I, I would. I, I you know, I, I, I think he opened some neon. Gorgonzola over there. Yeah. He's I, I think the neon is a fun little this. car, but when you're just talking, you know, sheer drivability, sheer torque, the neon cannot touch the Spirit RT. There's just no way. It's just not yeah. going to do it, and it sure as hell not going to touch the VR4. Another reason I like that Spirit, it's a 2.2 liter four cylinder with a, a turbo and an intercooler. The other cars are V6s. The Mitsubishi is the bully of the group. That thing's got a V6 with two turbos and an intercooler. The SHO is a three liter V6 that's really, really well tuned up. The, those two are bullies compared to that Dodge. That Dodge is a little four cylinder, but it kicks butt. So I'll see your spirit and I will raise you. And I think it was 1992-ish when they went out, 93. The last year of the first gen minivan came as an RT with color match bumpers and all the stuff. Mm -hmm. Those are cool. And I think that's a collector car if you're into vans and station wagons. But I want to throw a, a wrench in here because we did bring up minivans. Got to bring up the SVT Lightning truck. It's a very sought after truck now, very collectible. The very yeah. first one. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I like those a lot too. They're, they're a lot of fun. I know a guy who tunes them and lowers them and those things are incredible. Yeah, that's a great car. That had the Windsor in it if I remember correctly, or the Cleveland, one of those two motors, right? It's it's nothing fancy in base trim, but when they lightened it up, it was a hell of an engine. They are. And if, if you want to go that route, here I go with my Oldsmobile again, the Oldsmobile Silhouette, which was a dustbuster looking van. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they weren't performance oriented at all, but if you yeah. want to talk about cool minivans, now I, I don't know if we're going to go recommend to some guy, hey, for your first collector car, you should go get a minivan. I think you guys have been smoking a little too much. So let's just say like <laughs> that. <laughs> back on track that we're starting to talk about minivans i think we just lost <laughs> half the audience chris, right? chris i can i can pretty well assure you that mark is writing all this down and he's going to bomb us very soon here <laughs> no it's because brad we haven't good. heard from brad for like 90 minutes i mean <laughs> i know brad has just been sitting over there i'm like what does he do you know uh no thank you alex i'm okay good. uh the 928 was definitely one, although I'm a 968 guy like Mark. The 968 is just a, a phenomenal car. Ever since we started autocrossing together 20 years ago, I was drooling over the couple of the 968s that were there. So that car for me. But the, the 928 is a good distant second for that. I'm disappointed that nobody said anything 
truck wise other than the the svt lightning when we were talking about the 60s i was thinking like suburbans and and stuff like that but that's just because i'm a bigger guy and i like bigger vehicles the late 90s bmw 7 series those are beautiful cars. like the transporter yeah those are really 740 good. yeah that's yeah the 740 ils and the, you can get a 740 i sport i looked for one for a long time and they just was very hard to find so that's why i bought the s8 when i did but yeah those cars are phenomenal as well wow. okay but look guys i really i hate to cut in again i know i'm like the jay leno here but i i kind of got to get going i want to throw out a few that i i wrote down here for 90s cars that i think are worth looking into laugh at me don't laugh at me whatever i'll start with the honda del sol which okay. is basically a 914 or an x19 or a viper if you look at it it kind of looks like a baby viper the lexus sc300 or yep. sc400 coupe the other one which is kind of a weird one you might actually have to look it up very early the infinity m30 coupe or convertible then there here i go with the old mobiles again the old mobile calais quad four i, I want to see your facial reaction i want your opinion on this don 2002 to 2004 Thunderbird. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're a great car. I mean, if you just want to cruise and, and chill, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think those had the supercharger option at that point, did no, they? No, f- four point. They were just the 4.6 and then yeah. the 3.8. Uh, it's 3. a Lincoln 8. Mark X. It's a Jag X-Type or whatever underneath. So, yeah. yeah. Those could be collector cars. They're really cheap and they're they unique are. and they're very retro and they're in that retro at the end of the retro period really so i think those and, are something people could look out for and actually that specific generation which was the last of the classic bird if you will before the retro bird came out if you look at the interior of those they had a stunning interior they really had a very very nice interior and again you can get the mercury brother which had a, a kind of a blunted rear roof uh different different style altogether but you know building on that car it shared the chassis with the Lincoln Mark 8. And mm-hmm. the Mark 8 was a beast of a car, very technologically advanced. It had the 4.6 liter, but you had 32 valves, four overhead cams. Essentially, it was a ZR1. It had the same formula as a ZR1. Slippery, slippery body. Uh, one of those was recorded at, it was either El Mirage or the Salt Flats. I can't remember which, but one of those, very modified, went over 200 miles an hour. It was still just running. When I say modified, it wasn't the engine. It was the body and the interior and lowering it so it's even slippier through the wind. But it went it went something like 207 miles per hour with a factory engine. Yeah, building on your Thunderbird idea, you know, I take it a step further. And if you want to talk sedan again, here I go with the Lincolns, the Continental of that same basic era also used the Mark 8's engine, 32 valve, four overhead cams, but it was a front wheel drive. I'm sorry, Mark, but it was a front wheel drive platform, but it was a sedan. Very luxurious, very nice car. But Next, he'll so try that, to sell us on something with a North Star in it, like the XLR, but I'm going to leave that uh, where it is. Ah, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I like the North Star, but you know what's funny about the North Star? It is a good engine if you repair everything Cadillac did. If you go through and fix everything Cadillac did, you're going to be fine. But if you really want a solid Cadillac engine, look at the 4.9 liter. Anything with that 4.9 liter is going to, going to get you around. Let the 90s go Thank without you. talking about the Mitsubishi Eclipse. Yeah, that's a great one. I mean, it's such an iconic. <laughs> I agree. It's such an iconic 90s car, if only because of the Fast and the Furious, which. But isn't it already a collector car, though? It's not. No, no, no. Look at Brenner Trailer. They haven't sold one in five years. I'm not kidding. Type Mitsubishi Eclipse in there and an actual second gen Eclipse. And they haven't sold one since like 2019 or something. And you can't find them. I have looked. There's two on eBay Motors right now. And Mm. that's about it. I like where you're going, but I would say the collector car for me would be anything with an Eagle badge on it from that time period. Not the Mitsubishi. (laughs) It's the same car. It's just being <laughs> difficult. I've got like a cult classic that I oh have a super soft spot in my heart from the 90s, which is the Saab 900 S Turbo. It's a oh, that's the that's kind of the cool. end of the line, right? Yeah, it's like a it's that last of the wedgy, boxy, yeah. angular Saab. And then the nine the nine thousand came out, which was yeah. unlike yeah. anything else they had at that time. Yeah, yeah that the nine hundred turbo it's not going to win any beat anybody off the line but it's just funky and weird it's a sob i mean what do you expect yeah and we forget about sobs because they're goner now right 
Anytime I saw one of those cars, I thought it was just a weird looking 911. <laughs> I can say that. That's it, very because true. Because of how the, the Brad, windshield. You're a weird looking 911. <laughs> I would be a very weird looking 911 if I was a 911. <laughs> so I don't think we can go too much further into the 2000s. Like you guys said at the beginning, 2002 is really the cutoff, right? The last 20 years, we still have yet to determine what's going to be considered a classic. But I'll pose this Unless question. Unless it's as- the Porsche. Everything they made is a classic. Just okay. buy them all. Yeah, 100%. Just ask Porsche. <laughs> so I'll leave this as kind of the last lightning round question. As we look at the last 20 years, is there something right now that stands out that you guys are going, I think that's going to be a classic. Tons of like high-end cars that you could pick off. I find that less interesting because they're designed to be instant classics or whatever. Like there's this whole marketing thing. I don't know. The one that I would pick out, and I already alluded to it because I think it's an important car and I think it's a cool car, is the Tesla Roadster. Electric sports car, kind of groundbreaking. First of the Tesla lineage, which... I think we can all predict is going to be a huge thing. So it's going to be like the little kernel of car that kind of like started the whole EV car revolution. And, you know, that's a controversial thing for all of us old timers. But when you look at a car that's going to be looked back upon as important and pretty rare already, it's that. I, I totally agree. I mean, I don't like the car, but I totally agree in the sense that, you know, it's, it, it certainly was the beginning of an era. And in that way, it's going to be a seminal car for, the, you know, the next generation of technology and 100% be collectible. It's basically a paperweight as it sits today. Face um, junk. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, given the cost of the batteries and, and the unavailability of software updates and all the other things, like I'm confident that there will be an open source community that eventually is able to get that thing running and you'll be able to buy some aftermarket batteries and and be able to make a modern vehicle out of it. I think we fall into this trap very often. You said earlier, instant class. There's so many auto manufacturers today are kind of playing on the trope of the, you know, this is the last hurrah of the ICE platform. And whether it's Shelby Cobras or, or whatever, the thing is, is like, who knows when that last hurrah really will be, right? Like there, was, there will absolutely be a market for 5,000 or 10,000 cars for 150 grand that make a bunch of horsepower and run off internal combustion engines. And they're going to be making those through 2035 or 2040 or what, like it's not now. It's really not as much as anybody says. Now for your mainstream cars, certainly, but your Shelby GT500 is not the last one of those cars. It, it just isn't. You know, people tend to fall into those traps or they fall into the manual transmission trap on Porsche or whatever. It's like, oh my God, they put a manual in it. I'm one of those people. I own one, but I like it. Mm-hmm. That's that's why that's why I have it. That's, that's what I wanted. The values and the things that had happened to them as a result. You know, it's easy to point at like a Viper ACR or something, but the values of those have already gone through the roof. They couldn't move them off the damn lot for 145 grand when they were making them. Now they're 250 or $300,000. <sighs> If I had to pick a classic car that wasn't like an obvious bid at a classic, maybe it's a little basic, but I go back to like a C7, ZR1 or Z06, you know, it was the last front engine Corvette. It was the last, it was the last of a, of a generation. And they had a hard time moving those. They were selling, especially the Z06s with like huge discounts to get those things off the lots just to move them. And, you know, the market had kind of fallen out from them. And I think that's generally kind of indicative of a classic car. This is the best version of this platform, but it's when the platform is a little too long in the tooth for the contemporary market. But the classic car buyer doesn't care 20 years from now. They don't care 20 years from now that that car was three or four years too late for the market. That's the best version of that platform. That's the best version of that car. And I think, you know, that's that's a future classic. So I think you guys and the audience included has probably already guessed what my vote will be in this category. And this car has yet to be sold on the dealership lots. And that's the new Z400. I mean, if you think about it, it checks all the boxes. If we talk about the end of the ICE era and all this kind of thing, a two-door sp- proper sports coupe with a manual transmission, making decent horsepower, all that kind of stuff. I think that's going to be the car you buy today. And in 20 years is worth a mint because it really is the end of the line in a a lot of ways when you look at all those boxes. 
But, you know, Brad's been stewing on all this stuff throughout this episode. So after taking all this in, what do you think, Brad? What would you buy? 2016 Dodge Dart. <laughs> HHR, you, BT Cruiser, all those. You can, you can get a brand new 2016 Dodge Dart on dealer lots right now. <laughs> People do it every day, <laughs> at least one a month. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm going to say the F-Type Jag. Well, that's a good choice too. But I'm not going to say like the SVR or the, the, the big V8 one. I'm going to say the only one you could get with a manual, the, the, like the standard V6, because, I mean, because they, did just, they just didn't make very many of them. I like yeah. the supercharged six as well. If I was talking about a car nowadays, that's not a Dodge Dart. If I can fire a shot too, and I think this is hugely important. The thing I tell everybody who asks me anything about this, it's just buy what you like. Because then even if you're stuck with a, a total dud in terms of value, at least you like your car, you know, and you can have fun with it still. You might not be having some sort of Porsche, but you've got something that you enjoy. You know, there's a kid back in California, a real nice kid. He bought himself a uh, Mitsubishi Eclipse convertible, real nice car, five-speed car, real, real nice car. He was just having a ball with that thing. But behind his back, I hate to say it, but people were kind of making fun of him. And I said, why are you making fun of him? You know, and they all had these goofy, oh, well, it's a mass-produced Mitsubishi. Who cares? And I said, yes. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the 3000 GT VR4? Have you ever heard of the Stealth? Those are the big brothers of the Eclipse. And guess what? People are starting to clamor for those cars. I guarantee that Eclipse is going to be exactly the same way. Sorry to all of you out there who are kids. I know I'm the old fart of the group here, but he's a kid who's really getting into it. And the Mitsubishi is his gateway car, so to say. He's really enjoying the Mitsubishi. I'm hoping that later on he'll get into other cars. He seems to have a thing for the Japanese. But the bottom line, even if he can't sell that car for more than a dollar down the line, you know what? He had a ball. He had fun. Who cared? Let it go. And I think that goes back to a very important point that you talked about on your episode, Don, which is not dissuading people from the cars that they like, right? If they're attracted right. to it, even if it's not the most popular thing or not the smartest investment, foster that enthusiasm, get people mm -hmm. interested in the automotive world. So like all good What Should I Buy episodes, we never really come to a conclusion, but we give you plenty of food for thought. So hopefully if you're listening to this, you had a good time. We sure did. And maybe we gave you some things to think about that you weren't considering before. So to learn more about each of our guests, you can revisit their episodes on Brake Fix or continue this conversation over at garageriot.com, the social media platform for vehicle enthusiasts. And bring your garage or collection to the next level with Don over at garagestylemagazine.com. Get all the latest information on events, clubs, forums, and recommended vendors over with Rob at collectorcarguide.net. And if you want to clear out your garage, shop, or shed, list your parts today with Chris over at www.collectorpartsexchange.com. Well, gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for coming back on Break Fix and putting up with the shenanigans that is What Should I Buy? And we look forward to seeing you all again soon on another episode. We can't agree on what cars you should buy, but I think we can all agree on what car you should not buy. You know what car That's didn't make this list? A Pontiac Aztec. 100%. <laughs> I'm going to get one just to be cool. Yeah, that, yeah ironic. That's going to be a collector. Breaking Bad, I think, changed the profile of that car. Not it's, enough. It's, <laughs> it was great talking to all of you. Thanks, great to Don. meet you. And uh, I'll look forward to our next great. conversation. Great, great to good. see you, Don. Great to meet you. Good show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks for hanging out. It was uh it was a real blast. Signing off. Also later. Thanks, guys. Yeah. No worries. Thanks. If you like what you've heard and want to learn more about GTM, be sure to check us out on www.gtmotorsports.org. You can also find us on Instagram at Grand Touring Motorsports. Also, if you want to get involved or have suggestions for future shows, you can call or text us at 202-630-1770 or send us an email at crewchief at gtmotorsports.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, everybody. Crew Chief Eric here. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Break Fix, and we wanted to remind you that GTM remains a no annual fees organization, and our goal is to continue to bring you quality episodes like this one at no charge. As a loyal listener, please consider subscribing to our Patreon for bonus and behind-the-scenes content, extra goodies, and GTM swag. 
For as little as $2.50 a month, you can keep our developers, writers, editors, casters, and other volunteers fed on their strict diet of Fig Newtons, Gummy Bears, and Monster. Consider signing up for Patreon today at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. And remember, without fans, supporters, and members like you, none of this would be possible.